call me the trail snail out here on the AT. And I've been uh, about 1,150 miles so far. My trail name is Flying Ryan. And this is the second year I'm attempting to do this trail. My name's Helen Devery, um, and I've hiked 1,150 miles so far, just over halfway on the trail. Um, and my trail name's Motrin Along. <laughs> my name's Chad Eichen. I'm uh, from Dayton, Ohio, and my trail name's the Sherpa. My trail name is Lightning Rod, and I've hiked from Springer Mountain to here, which is around I don't know, 1,150 miles, I guess, so far. My name is Charles Mixon, and my trail name is Stumpy, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. A uh, trail named Tree Frog. Uh, started in Georgia and I've gotten here. It's about, I don't know, I think about 11, 1100 miles or something. And uh, hope to go all the way. My name's Jimmy Martin. My trail name is Jimmy No Stop. And I've walked this far all the way to Port Clinton, Pennsylvania, which is over halfway, and I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> My name is Lori Gordon, and I'm traveling under the trail name of Dr. Strange, which is very appropriate, I think. And according to this year's data book, I have hiked 1,263.1 miles. My trail name is Jambalaya. So far I've got about 1,000 miles under my belt and uh, I'm hiking the AT, the Appalachian Trail. Our trail name is the Camels. We started uh, three, close to four months ago and um, we've hiked about 1,250 miles from Springer Mountain. And we're the uh, grist mill hikers, or the gristies for, for short. short. <laughs> and uh, we've hiked also from Springer Mountain. And we started April 6th, and uh, we've come. Over 1,100 miles. I'm from Manitoba, Canada, and my trail name is Gator. And the reason I call myself Gator is because I'm going south to Florida. And I wear gators all the time, and a big green pack on my back, and, uh, and I drink Gatorade all the time. Well, my name is Dick Moyer. Uh, my trail name is DM. That's the way I signed the registers. From uh, Madeira Beach, Florida, which is a suburb of St. Petersburg. I'm Dan Bruce, and my name on the trail is Wingfoot. Uh, I'm currently doing my sixth AT through hike, and have planned seven. I've got one next year already planned. And I've got about 15,000 AT miles, and have seen about 8,000 through hikers in the last seven years. And uh, I've kind of seen what will work on the trail. They call me Ringo on the trail, and I've done about 1,200 miles. I'm from Connecticut. I'm Kathy Van. I live in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, we've been hiking the trail now, my husband and I, for about almost nine years. And with this, we have less than 440 miles to go. So we're just doing it piecemeal, but having a great time with it. My name is uh, Christian Paquin. I'm from Montreal. And my trail name is just uh, Christian de Montréal. My trail name is Moon Shadow of the Trail Twins. And I've done, I guess, about 1,600 miles so far. I'm uh, from Atlanta, Georgia. My uh, trail name is Gone. <laughs> I've uh, traveled a little over 1,600 miles at this point. My real name is Pat Foreman, F-O-R-E-M-A-N. I took the trail name Walkabout, and I usually sign my name P with an A-T, as in Appalachian Trail symbol. My trail name is Big Bird. I've hiked 1,550 miles this year. I hiked 1,600 miles in 1999. My trail name is California Bear, and uh, at this point I have traveled uh, 1,603 miles. I'm Big Red, I'm a southbounder, um, I've hiked 617 miles so far. My name is 204, and so far I've come 2,053 miles. I am the Wookiee, um, I've gone, wait, how far have you gone so far? I forget. 2,053 miles. My real name is Julia. So first came the Julinator, and then uh, I retired the Julinator uh, and started um, savoring the trip a little bit more, which means I did uh, less miles. And uh, so I became Jules. And uh, I've done, actually, uh, I'm in the middle of the 1900, so a little less than 2,000 miles so far. My name is Baba Louie, that's my trail name. And I'm um, at the summit of Mount Washington in New Hampshire. And uh, it started in Springer Mountain, and I've come about 
a little over 1,800 miles so far. My name is Eric Rushley. Uh, we don't have trail names. It's a little <laughs> bit of an oddity on the, the trail here. My wife, Trish. Um, we come 1,760 some. 60 some odd miles to get this far. Hi there, my name is uh, Big John. I hiked the AT in 94. My name is Loose Goose. I'm an Appalachian Trail through hiker. I currently have done 1,770 miles of the 2,170. I have about 400 to go. Roger B. And I'm at the uh, roughly the 1,800 mile mark. My name is Smokey. This is my second time on the AT. I went north in 1999. I'm headed south this year and I've made about 800 miles so far. My name is Warren Doyle. Uh, I have no trail name. Uh, I'm just plain Warren Doyle. I've walked the entire trail eight times, uh, which supposedly is the most that's been walked by any one individual. And I'm almost finished with my ninth hike. So I, I have a little bit over 18,000 miles of walking on the Appalachian Trail. Well, when I made my decision to, to do the trail, I had quite a bit of the gear that I, that I needed. Uh, I hadn't sat down and, and figured out mileage or planned my mailboxes or anything like that. Uh, I do mine with a phone call. When I need my, my food dropped, I call and tell them where to drop it and when I'll be there. Uh, I only had about two weeks worth of preparation. The only preparation for coming out here is Eat as much as you can before you start and take it slow and easy. A lot of people, I think, come out and they try to do a good 15 miles a day, and really, the only thing you can do is just, you know, do eight or stop when you're tired and take it easy. Don't try to kill yourself. I came over here three months before, before I started the trail and we did nothing until the last two days. We bought that gear. <laughs> We've got all our gear in that time. We spent a lot of time comparing what sort of gear we wanted and prices in the different stores. Um, but you we can, joined the Y. We, yeah, we joined the Y to get fit. We didn't do that much. <laughs> <laughs> really, you can come out here, I think, if you're... You don't have to be excessively fit. You know, the first few weeks will really get you into shape. But we were in reasonable shape. Not good shape, but reasonable shape, I yeah. think. Much better now. Much, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We did a lot of reading of uh, the Appalachian Trail books, uh, books that are put out by the ATC. And uh, that, that really helped us understand what we were getting into. Um, we knew it was going to be tough. And, uh, and the reading experiences by other hikers really helped bring that home. And, um, and in addition, we, we, we did do some working out uh, at the gym. Um, Helen did a lot of swimming. And we did, did a lot of practice hikes too, which, which are really important. I took a data book and laid out a schedule um, so that I'd have an idea of where to mail things to and when. Um, based on, uh, I think I based the schedule on 15 miles a day average hiking. Um, and I planned it for about eight months, seriously planned it for about eight months and did a lot of research for the past year before I, before I came out. Um, made initial food drop packages up and uh, have altered them some along the way, but um, most of what I've planned so far has pretty much come fairly well on schedule. I like to run, and I've always run, so I just kind of stepped up my mileage, my running mileage. I also worked out on a uh, Stairmaster a little, little bit, but I don't think there's anything anybody can do other than actually hiking to completely prepare for the um, for the trail, particularly the start down in Georgia, which is pretty rough. I just don't think there's any substitute other than actually getting out there and taking some, um, some practice or some shakedown type hikes. If you got a good attitude, you don't need to prepare, really. I mean, as long as, I figured if my pack didn't weigh more than a third of my body weight, then I was, I could survive. And 
it was just at exactly a third of my body weight and uh, I'm still here. <laughs> I bought my pack a month before I left. I uh, w um, took it out on an overnight once. <laughs> it was on level land and I almost killed myself. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. I, I really didn't prepare that much. I sent away for information from the Appalachian Trail Conference, got all the guidebooks and, uh, uh, and the data book and the hand, through hiker's handbook and I read through them, uh, not the guidebooks. Um, I guess what I did with the uh, data book was I went through uh, every day, I went through and decided um, where I would stay every, every night along the way. And uh, if, if you look at it now, I don't know you, if you can see all the little dots I have, but <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's kind of humorous as to what I, where I thought I would get uh, uh, early on in the trip. And even now, you know, I have myself down for like 30 mile days. I'm glad that I didn't prepare my mail drops and package them all up and tape them all the way through to Maine because there was a lot of stuff I had in my mail drops that I didn't need, <laughs> that I didn't want, that didn't taste good, that was too heavy, that uh, was just ridiculous to have. Uh, I had a rice mix, uh, uh, short grain whole rice, uh, lentils and barley, and I think I had like three pounds of it in every mail drop, <laughs> and that stuff goes a long way. So uh, uh, anyway, I'm glad that I only did my mail drops up to a certain point, then I knew what I needed, and then I can, I've been able to tell my parents what I need, and uh, it's worked out pretty well. I, I bought uh, uh, insurance, uh, Blue Cross. I, I never, ever in my life would have thought of getting insurance, but I, I thought that that was kind of an extended hike, and like anything could happen, and if you get into a hospital room here in the States, you know, they say it's like it could be four or $500 a day, so I, I found that uh, that insurance probably would be would be something to uh, to have, and uh, I've used it already once. Um, I've had uh, severe weight 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 loss problems, and diarrhea, uh, lightheadedness, uh, dizzy spells. Uh, I, I got into Lee, and I got uh, checked out, and I'll have my results in a couple of days. But uh, uh, I think it's probably just fatigue from pushing myself and stuff. But uh, but I, I found that uh, insurance is, is very, very valuable. Being from Florida where it's as, about as flat as it can possibly be, there isn't a whole lot I could do. Now I did go out and every weekend I would go out and try to do as much walking as possible, mainly to break the boots in. For mental, I know it's not a publicity, but I did bought five million steps. And uh, one thing that I like about this movie was you can, uh, I mean, the, the, the video tells you all the bullshit that you will see on the trail, except Poison Ivy, actually. And, and um, I mean, I know when I left how much I will suffer. If you're running to get in shape, you're working different muscles. You know, the only way to prepare yourself to carry a 50-pound pack over mountains is to carry a 50-pound pack over mountains. You know, you can't really, uh, you can't really do anything to to substitute for it, you know, I mean, you just you kind of got to, got to kind of do it. If you like backpacking, just kind of take whatever backpacking you've done and extend it for about five, six months, and that's, that's what you're getting. So if you went out for a week, uh, take that and add a few extra weeks to it. And it's one long, continuous backpacking trip. And I hate ups. I don't care what anybody says, I hate up. I hate walking up. If it's up, I still hate it. I'll never learn to like it, but I'll do it. Uh, I don't stay in hotels when I get to a town. Uh, either camp or find a shelter somewhere. I do have a bad habit of staying in towns too long, but it's always in a hostel or something. It's pretty nice. Um, <clears throat> Beer and pizza seems to be the big expense, uh, but uh, it can be done on a lot less than $2,000. At the moment, I'm going about $800 every two months, so $400 a month. 
Um, that's just for living expenses, and I, that's what I had been bargaining on. I'm probably spending a little bit more than that. I worked for, when I graduated from college, I worked for two years and saved up during that time. So I've, I've probably saved, I've got about four to five thousand dollars, but I don't want to use it all. That's just in case. Um, and Chad, you're about the same. We both worked until we came out, so we had enough money saved. But I think you could do it on about between two and a half and three thousand dollars, depending on the amount of time you spend in town. That's we, where we spend. That's our money. where we spend our money. You don't spend anything out here, <laughs> but as soon as we get into town, you can blow a hundred dollars. Easy, it's gone. Is you go to restaurants and you go to hotels and things like that, and your money just floats away. I generally plan on spending about five thousand dollars or so. Um, I'm of the opinion that. Um, that I, I ought to be able to indulge myself after a week or so sleeping in the woods and roughing it and all that. I ought to be able to indulge myself. Therefore, when I get close to a, uh, or had the opportunity to stay at a motel or a lodge or whatever, I take advantage of it. It's fairly expensive, but, um, you know, I, f I feel like it's justified. I feel like I kind of deserve it after all those miles. Um, but that does run up the cost excessively. Um, the, um, I don't think that, in my opinion, that what we're doing over six months, by and large, is less expensive than the normal standard of living in town. So I'm not concerned with spending, you know, that extra money to, um, you know, for a few luxuries. Because we were in one town, I even I got escargot, I got Guinness Stout, I got you know, everything I could possibly think of, and you also eat twice as much of it, so, so you end up having you know, this gigantic bill at the end of every town you go to. It's been told to me that uh, outside of gear, uh, you should expect to pay a dollar a mile uh, to hike the Appalachian Trail, and I think that's wrong. <laughs> and I've learned the hard way. I'm going to be broke by the time I'm done this. Uh, gear and everything, I'm not sure because I had some of the stuff beforehand, but all the gear, I would say, costs between $700 and $1,000 for me, probably. Uh, and then hiking the, just the food you have to pay for, you have to think of the food you have to pay for that you eat on the trail, the food that you eat when you get in towns and restaurants, uh, the lodging, uh, the hotels you have to stay in, um, uh, the film that you buy, the film that you process, the, uh, there's uh, so much, you know, the, the, the extra things that you're not ready for. <laughs> Believe it, you're, you're not going to be ready for it. You know, you're going to have some gear that really is worthless out on the trail and you need something else and you have to pay for it. You, 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 I mean, I guess you could rough it and do without it, but if you want to be, want to have a good hike, you're going to need it and you have to shell out the extra money for it. I think for me, it's going to cost me this year or this hike uh, between thirty-five and four four thousand dollars, thirty-five hundred and four thousand dollars, uh, and that kind of makes me upset because I wasn't ready for it, and uh, I thought I'd have a little extra money left over, and I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to have uh, family pick me up in Maine and take me back. I know some people hitch hitchhike back from Katahdin, but um, by the time I'm done, I'm not going to want to hitchhike, and uh, I won't have money for a bus. <laughs> really, I mean, I'm going to my last dime and penny, and uh, I think I might even have to borrow some money before I'm done. Um, a lot of people will bring credit cards. Uh, I have a credit card and a, a debit card for the automatic teller machines, um, and most of those teller machines are on national networks, computer networks, um, so you can usually always get cash. You can have somebody wire you money. Um, I carry a little bit of green stuff, too, in addition to the credit card. Um, it, that is something that should not be a problem because you will plan for it. Um, if you don't plan for it, then you should go back and think about your whole trip because 
again, like it or not, uh, you know, it's nice to think you're out in the wilderness, you don't need money, you don't need blah, blah, blah. The fact of the matter is you're going to need some cash along the way. I actually use the web to uh, manage my affairs while I'm gone. So, for example, I use online banking at home. So when I actually go into a small town, I will go online, check what my bills are, whether it's student loans or, um, you know, my storage fees. I pay those bills literally on the road, and I can adjust payments, uh, transfer funds between accounts, and it's just virtually no different than what I do back at home. So that, that's kind of a seamless thing. You should be willing to stay in the woods right next to town if you need to, because it can save you so much money. I mean, 30 bucks a night on a hotel room is cheap, but when you're hiking, 30 bucks adds up really quickly, especially when you go town to town to town. I started out with $2,000, and I spent, I had about $1,300 uh, before Virginia. So I had to learn quickly how to manage my money better and to utilize uh, hiker boxes, which are uh, trade-out boxes and, and hotels and hostels and post offices where you can get free food and not have to buy this extra supplement stuff for your mail drops. Or you may not have to have mail drops at all. I, I, heard, I remember one hiker who told me that he made it 400 miles without buying any food at all on you just using hiker boxes. Especially when the weather has not been so good, it is a huge temptation to um, grab a bed and a shower. Um, and uh, I, I just kind of work through that mentally before I go into town and uh, uh, just make a firm decision uh, to go in and out and um, look forward to setting up my tent or I, I try to pick a location um, coming out of town that's within easy reach so I'm not having this huge uh, mileage looming in front of me. I'm financing uh, my uh, trip basically with um, credit card and, uh, and, and a ATM card. Um, credit card not meaning that I um, uh, go in debt, I pay that off every month, so it's basically like cash for me. But um, I feel comfortable just carrying those two cards. Um, I, I find it fairly easy to get cash, um, you know, either through um, a post office Every post office has a, a little sign in there that says um, if you pay with your ATM card, you can get cash back up to $50. Um, that's a great um, setup because um, $50 gets you um, at least to the next post office, uh, if not l more, further. Um, plus, you don't have to pay the ATM fees. If you go to a, a regular ATM at a bank, you always have to pay that, sometimes two fees to use uh, an a bank that's not yours or, um, you know, just the ATM. Um, you can do the same thing in grocery stores very often. Uh, even in small towns, um, they allow you to get um, some cash back. Uh, I know that a lot of people use uh, traveler's checks, but I find that too, um, too tedious, actually. I find it a lot easier to use those two cards. And I carry traveler's checks. So if they would get lost or stolen, at least I can get them replaced. And uh, I... Uh, as far as financial planning, uh, I, I, I plan on, on doing 90 cents a mile. So if I do long days, then, uh, then I can kind of splurge and, and go and have a shower somewhere. But I, I've uh, very seldom gone into town to shower or whatever. Uh, some people, they stop at every hostel they can, every church they can. Uh, I find that I, I take a shower on the average about once every two weeks. But uh, I, I like to go swimming. I usually wash my clothes in, in, in the lake or whatever. I go swimming with them. Uh, I'm probably not one of the best smelling hikers there are on the trail, but uh, I find that I've been getting by pretty good. Here's my traveler's checks. I started out with about $200 in cash and $1,000 in traveler's checks, and these are $50 denomination. I haven't had any problem cashing that size traveler's check. Dealing with banks, try to avoid it. Get cash and traveler check, that's it. I ran out of money. I, uh, I worked, worked full time while I was going to school to earn the money and 
And after equipment and everything else, I came on the trail with probably a thousand dollars. And uh, you know what they say is a dollar a mile, and I think that works out about right because I got about halfway with my thousand dollars, and that that's where it ran out. And uh, I'm just lucky to have support at home, you know, like I get some food drops here and there and get a little money here and there from different relatives and that's pretty much what's keeping me going. Uh, if a hiker wants a, just a, almost a total woods experience with very little town visits and so on uh, and one can do the trail fairly inexpensively, uh, I would say probably a, with a minimum of uh, twelve, fourteen hundred dollars uh, and that's really cutting it close but uh, if for a normal through hike, which means going into towns, uh, having a restaurant meal fairly often, uh, staying occasionally in a motel, uh, taking advantage of the social opportunities that come up, uh, then uh, probably uh, a good rule of thumb is a dollar a mile and to budget that way. Maybe with a little extra toward the northern end of the trail because it's a little more expensive in New England. Uh, but uh, as a general rule of thumb, a dollar a mile. Uh, and uh, that does not include, of course, equipment or travel to and from the trailhead. But on the trail itself, I think it's safe to budget a dollar a mile, and that's good as al also planning where you need money. Uh, but uh, then, of course, with the, uh, the guidebooks and the through hikers books that are available, one can plan a little more closely as to how much in each town. And, of course, that would depend on lodging and uh, how many days a person plans to stay in a town and that type of thing. Uh, but uh, it's not an expensive trip in terms of uh, uh, a six-month vacation. Uh, but uh, I, I would, I personally would recommend uh, a minimum of $2,200 for the trip, uh, unless one wants to go a little more Spartan, and it can be done. But most through hikers find that they enjoy the social aspects of the trail. That means having an occasional restaurant meal, having a few beers or whatever occasionally, and that type of thing, and uh, and that adds up and, uh, I, and I found some people really getting bummed out on the trip because they didn't have that few extra dollars here and there to take part in some of these activities and they began to feel they were a little left out. However, I've seen a few individuals that did want that Spartan trip and didn't want any part of the social life and they can also uh, hike a little less expensively. Uh, there are other factors such as whether you buy your food in bulk before you leave and mail it to yourself and that type of thing that can vary the cost a little bit. But, uh, but most people, like I say, will need around $2,200. And even most first time through hikers spend even a little more than that because there are opportunities that they will have one time uh, and they might want to spend a few extra dollars. Uh, so as far as handling finances on the trail, uh, probably traveler's checks are the, are the single best method of carrying money on the trail. It's the safest, of course. And uh, the uh, just about every place on the trail. I've, I've never heard of a place that refused a traveler's check. Uh, a lot of people are, of course, you getting, uh, using uh, the uh, MasterCard and Visa to get cash advances and things like that, and that's becoming more practical as we get more uh, uh, of the uh, networks that will handle that type of uh, transaction in towns near the trail. But it's still most of the small towns, uh, it's hard to get money. And so I would recommend traveler's checks uh, uh, or, uh, yeah, traveler's checks, I think, probably, is, I still would recommend is the best way to handle uh, money on the trail. Well, I wear the uh, Vasque Sundowners. They're a medium weight leather boot. I, I really like them. They give you support, but they're, they're not heavy like the, like the big, big uh, leather boots. Um, they're a real good product. A lot of people are wearing these boots. And, I don't know of anyone that's had some severe problems with him. I've only had two blisters the entire 1,100 miles so far. My camp shoes, I like those fairly near the top. <laughs> that's the first thing I do is take my boots off. These are really good um, trail shoes, Tevas. They slip on real nice and they're better than, I guess, slippers because they're kind of like shoes. And if they wear out, you just Pull up the store and you can get another pair. When I hike, I use two different kinds of footwear that I alternate. Um, I have my trail running shoes here, uh, which uh, I like to use a lot, but my
preferred method of foot travel is definitely my sandals because um, my feet stay, stay aired out. Um, my body temperature is cooler as I hike. As soon as I put my shoes on, I can tell the difference. Um, your feet sweat a lot when you hike. And when you're, even though this shoe is a, is a breathable, lightweight shoe, um, the moisture still can cause problems with um, blisters and foot odor, <laughs> which I'm having a problem with now. And that's why I'm freshening everything up here in this break in Monson. So uh, the disadvantage of sandals, however, uh, one obvious disadvantage is the potential to stub your toe and for sticks to uh, jab your feet and all sort of uh, abrasion related injuries you can uh, incur. Um, but another uh, disadvantage is going back to moisture is, uh, is you lose all the moisture off your feet. It evaporates very quickly and so feet tend to dry out and crack. And see here I have some cracking that's happening that was actually quite painful at one time. Um, so what I try to achieve when I hike is I wear my sandals until I start to notice that, they're, that my feet are drying out too much. And I either put on socks or I put it on my shoes. Um, also, for some rugged, for more rugged areas uh, with a lot of rocks, when you're stepping in between rocks and ha having to lift your feet up, you might need some some top covering. And I would prefer to use my shoes in those spots. Um, I've also s taken a lot of time to strengthen my feet and my ankles before the hike. Um, I walked in sand a lot um, as a training um, method. I also walked in my shoes on gravel to further strengthen my ankles. And that has, I think, allowed me to be comfortable in my sandals over long stretches. I've done many 20-mile days. I've done a 30-mile days in sandals and had no problem. But I definitely think uh, ankle conditioning is important. I hike wearing some a pair of uh, the low cut very lightweight hiking shoes uh, I know some people prefer a running shoe uh, in any event you know I find that you, you do need a, a, a sole that's built to grip on rock and, and trail conditions uh, the lighter shoe I, I feel actually provides me with uh, less fatigue over the long, over the over the course of the day uh, maybe a little more agility jumping from rock to rock or stepping from rock to rock as long as it has it's as long as the soles are rigid enough to su to support your weight across rocks so that the rocks don't beat your feet up and give you stone bruises or stress fractures there's a big conception that ankle support comes from the sides of the boots i don't per personally believe that first of all if you're doing any hiking or any athletic thing at all in advance you probably have strong enough ankles to support yourself anyhow you do it the rest of the year without extra support uh, if you actually grab the top of any boot and try to bend that top part, it's not really that rigid there. Uh, some folks that I spoke to have implied that the stability for your ankle actually comes from, from the stability of the actual base, of the, the sole of the boot. Uh, I do occasionally roll an ankle. I've never suffered any pain or sprain from it. I know people that hike in high top boots that also occasionally roll ankles. So. I mean, I suppose in the very beginning that that could be an issue. I think that after you've hiked a couple hundred miles in low-cut shoes, your ankles are going to be strong enough to hold you up. These particular shoes are made by Merrill's. I already went through a pair of hiking shoes made by Vask. Um, they are a little over a pound. They're very light, and uh, they've got a pretty good sole on them. Uh, they're not very durable. I kind of expect to get 500 miles or so out of a pair. And in light of the fact that they are light and they're fairly inexpensive, then um, I just prefer to go with the hiking shoes. A lot of people wear the big uh, leather hiking shoes or the high top, high, I mean the big hiking boots or the, um, 
the um, the uh, high top type shoes because they need ankles for well, I don't I, I've never had any problems with it because I got such short fat ankles and I don't need the ankle support so um, I just prefer the hiking shoes. This is my third pair of shoes I like the lighter weight shoes um, I've had two that are made by Merrill um, this is I got these in Washington when I was there for the fourth um, the soles have a tendency to, to, the treads wear out real quick. But as you can see, I, I like the two pairs of socks. They keep my feet nice and tight in there. They, it gets a little hot, but you're gonna get hot anyway, so you might as well be comfortable. I started out with a pair of Dunham boots, which were really heavy and suede, or kind of suede leather, and uh, they weighed a lot. They must have weighed six pounds, and uh, I, finally got rid of They were something that I had before I started out and I hadn't realized that they had kind of dried out and tightened up on my foot. I thought I wore them around enough before I started out but I guess I didn't and I got a lot of blisters from them and so finally I bought a pair of uh, boots from L.L. Beans and these are Cresta Hikers and I would say they're supposed to be for rugged uh, terrain hiking and uh, they've worked pretty well. I like them. These boots were made by the Merrill Company. Um, I had them, I've had them maybe seven years or so. Um, I've worn them on other trips. And as you can see, the Pennsylvania Rocks really did a job on them. I'm going to try and get them resold, or I may just have to get a new pair of boots. Um, from Springer Mountain, where I started, up to Harpers Ferry, I was wearing some medium weight uh, boots by high tech combination leather and uh, fabric. And they did pretty well, I think. Um, when they get wet, they dry out fairly quickly. I don't think you need a real heavy leather boot like this for down south. Um, for the rocks in Pennsylvania, as I think anyone who has traveled through it can tell you, um, you need something a little stronger. Um, in addition to, this, to the ankle support that you get from these, um, a lot of the rocks are really sharp and they can cut in. They, if you were wearing a pair of light, lighter weight boots, um, the rocks could go right through the fabric, and that's where the leather really helps you in Pennsylvania. And I also wear some extra padding. These are Spankos, which you can probably get in any uh, sporting goods store. Uh, somebody asked me about my shoes the other day. They're Merrill shoes. Uh, they're basically the uh, wilderness type. Uh, a lot of people have had problems with them on the trail. Uh, the soles right inside here and right down here will pop off. Mine started happening right around Duncannon, and uh, what I did there is I went into uh, Duncannon, there was a cobbler there, and I had them put new soles on, because they were pretty worn, but if you can see, I had them nail them all the way around. Now, that adds about a good four to five ounces, maybe even a half a pound onto my boots, but uh, so far they filled up. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with them. They're, I still consider them cruel shoes, though, because uh, they'll tell you when you've gone 10 miles. You'll cry when you go on 15 miles, and by the time you do 20 miles, your feet will throb until the morning when you wake up. Uh, and the worst thing in the world is when you get up in the morning and you step on your feet for the first time, it shockwaves through your body. My gaiters, um, I got these uh, just down, down south of the um, um, Shenandoah National Park. I had a pair of small, small ones, but they didn't really keep the water out. These right here keep the water out very nicely. Uh, they also do a good job of keeping the rocks out. They usually end up up, up to here, especially when it rains, or when you're going through what we like to call car wash, which is uh, uh, weeds that are that are up to here or weeds that are up to your waist. Uh, in the in the, it might be uh, dry out that day, but with the dew and everything, you get a lot of water in your legs, and they actually come up like this. They fit in there really nice. They keep the rocks out and stuff like that. I started out with the mid-weight Vasques, and I found that when you get to the hot weather, like today, it's supposed to be 97 and humid. Back uh, before Cloverdale, we had a stretch of hot days. My feet, all of a sudden, and I was wearing a single pair of socks with those Vasques, you know, full leather uppers, fairly lightweight boots, my feet were just turning all red because they just didn't breathe well enough. And that's why I opted. I said, fine, I'm going to get the lighter weight boots. And so I have these, they're high techs, they're all right, but I'm not as happy with the protection from rocks as I thought. I thought I'd have more protection than I'm getting as far as a, a strong sole. This is all my foot, you know, care. Just because uh, I've been breaking out a new pair of boots, uh, my boots went kaput. They're uh, Timberland, by the way. 
Um, they're not a bad boot. Uh, I, I'm, you know, pretty satisfied with them. Uh, I called the company, you know, said what I was doing, said that the boots were 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 going on me, and they sent me a brand new pair free. So, so I, uh, you know, it was it was worth it. One thing that uh, I really like is second skin, which not a lot of people use that I've seen, but uh, it's like a gel pad, and you know, you put it on if you have a blister, you put it on at night, and uh, I don't know, they say you're not supposed to walk with it, you know, you just use it at night and then use the, the moleskin or whatever during the day, but it actually heals it, you know, it has, it's a medicated gel pad, you know, it actually does something, you're not just covering it up. And another thing that works really well are, are the callus cushions, or the um, bunion cushions, which are, uh, let me see if I can get one that's actually out. I guess not. Well, it's like a, a circle, and then there's a hole cut in the middle. So uh, instead of just covering up a blister, you, you cover around it so that you, know, you release the pressure. Because if you just pat it and pat it, you're just building more pressure, and you're going to hurt yourself more. One thing I've learned about sizing boots, and it seems that this very fundamental mistake, uh, I, I don't know ex exactly where the problem comes from, but very few people know how to size their boots. The trick that I've learned from a couple of very good people, very interested in uh, fitting the hikers, uh, Jeff, Jeff Hansen being one, and I've heard the Mr. Limmer of Limmer Boots does the same thing, that when you put your foot in your boot, unlaced, and kind of tap it up against the wall, you should be able to slide two fingers behind your heel. And what this does is uh, when you sense your foot back in your boot, it allows you room in the front so when you're going down the hill that you don't uh, jam your toes together. It seems like not too many people realize this because a lot of people have uh, serious blistering problems. And, and even if they go to another pair of boots, you see the same person having the same problems. I don't think there's any pair of boots that'll last the entire trip no matter what they say. Uh, every year there's a certain boot make that is the, is the rage of everybody and then it seems like a year or two later you find that same boot falling apart for everybody. Uh, the three main types of boots that are used are the very lightweight sneaker type boots. Uh, those work well for a lot of people including myself. Uh, uh, I have strong legs and strong ankles and I love the flexibility of having a lightweight boot. Other people seem to enjoy having a full leather boot, a heavier boot, uh, to protect them from uh, the abrasion of rocks and things of that sort. Plus, they feel they give, it gives better support. And uh, my only suggestion there is that you just try on a lot of boots, and uh, uh, preferably with a loaded pack if you can do that. Uh, you might have to walk into the outfitter with your pack loaded and try on boots, but I would suggest that uh, you do so because you'll get a true idea of how that boot's going to fit, feel on, on the trail. Uh, the important thing to look for in a boot as far as uh, fit is to make sure that you have enough room when you are loaded because your foot will spread a little bit and to make sure that you have enough toe room but also you want to make sure that the boot has enough support in the front so that when you lunge forward as you will going down here you won't slide forward. You also want to make sure that the heel cup uh, fits the shape of your heel because if it rides uh, high or low it will cause you problems. Uh, and the, all the break-in in the world probably won't correct that. Um, the best thing to do as far as boots breaking them in is to get in them and walk and walk and walk and walk. Uh, there's no substitute for that. Uh, I know on my first hike I made the mistake of thinking if I don't use my boots too much they'll last longer on the trail. Well, uh, the boots went quite a bit further than my feet did on that trip uh, and I uh, suffered with blisters in the early part of the trip. Uh, but. Uh, uh, Breaking in boots is very important. You'll probably need at least two pair for the trip. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to buy two pair, but at least be prepared to buy a second pair along the way. Uh, and it's probably a good idea to have two pair to start and try to get them both as broken in as possible. Uh, I've used as many as five sets of the lightweight boots, although I've uh, gotten as much as uh, 800, 900 miles out of a pair of lightweight boots. Uh, the full leather boots will often give uh, quite a bit of of uh, more wear, uh, although not necessarily so. Uh, there are people that have gone the whole distance in just about every brand of boot made, and there are other people that have only gotten 400 miles out of them, so there's no way to predict 
Uh, it depends on your hiking style, and, and some people are just rougher on boots than others. So uh, be prepared to buy at least a second pair and possibly a third pair along the way somewhere. And it's not hard to find boots. Uh, uh, as you go along, you can order them from the mail order places and have them sent ahead and, or, or even arrange to have your outfitter back home uh, mail a pair of the same boots that you uh, started in if they're working well for you. Uh, socks are another important item. I, uh, I personally carry as many as I can justify weight-wise because I like to change every day. Uh, but you should carry either a lot of socks or be prepared to wash and clean your socks often. Uh, as to whether you wear wool socks with a liner or one of the synthetic socks, here again, that's personal preference. Uh, if possible, buy your boots and socks together so that they will be compatible. Uh, people got into a lot of trouble trying to change to a different sock thickness in the middle of their hike. And so it's good to buy those together and make them one system that fit well. I like the um, mesh bag because I can just pick it up and look through it. I don't have to empty it out or rummage through it. Uh, I keep my breakfast in here. Most of the time I have a Carnation Instant Breakfast and a Pop-Tart. That's my usual breakfast. And I have a peanut butter and um, tuna fish and cheese and honey that I keep in here for my lunches. This is my dinners in here. I also keep my powdered milk in here. I have um, Lipton, what I eat mostly is the Lipton uh, noodles and sauce or uh, minute rice. That's what I eat the most of, or somebody else's food. <laughs> what I think is pretty good for lunch is the uh, English muffins with uh, peanut butter. Just put peanut butter and honey on them. That two of those will load you down till, till dinner. I like to eat cereal in the morning, Cheerios, Honey Nut Cheerios, because they're the, um, you don't really add sugar to them and they're very light food. I just mooched some oatmeal off of people, so I've been eating oatmeal for a couple days. And just keep all my dinners in one bag and breakfast is in one bag. And lunch I usually keep on my side pockets here. I just added them this year. Last year I found out that I had to, was digging through my pack so much that I put side pockets on them. And I keep my lunches and snacks in there, so I just go through that. Inside my pack, I've got my food bag. We, um, when we started out, we were carrying about, I haven't got very much food just now, we were carrying about five days worth of food. Now we carry three days maximum because there's so many small towns through this area that we can resupply in that it seems pointless to carry a lot of food. We have meal drops, perhaps not as many as everybody else. I think we have 11 through the whole trail. One every, um, 200. One every 200 miles, yeah. usually. And then sometimes we have too much in the mail drops which we forward ahead to other post offices just along the trail. But I'd say generally we carry two to three days worth of food just now. There's not a lot in that, as you can see. Uh, a lot of people think that, that freeze-dried is the only way to go. And, and there are a few people that, that do carry freeze-dried food. Um, for us, it wasn't really a, an option because they're, they're extremely expensive. And uh, uh, we've found everything we need at, at your basic uh, grocery store. Um, for lunches, for instance, uh, since we're only going about two or three days between grocery stores, we, we carry uh, cold meats and bread and cheese, and that'll last a couple days, and we don't have to, we haven't really gotten into the peanut butter routine or, or some of the other uh, typical hiker foods that you would think of. Um, we eat pretty well at dinners. Um, we carry cans of chicken and tuna, which we add to, uh, it's either rice or ramen noodles or mac and cheese and uh, it, it fills us up and gives us all the, all the calories and protein that we need. And when we get into town that's when we load up on fruits and, and other vegetables, that sort of thing. Macaroni and cheese, Lipton noodles and sauce, um, I carry a, a squeeze parquet always out of town until that's gone. Um, a pepperoni stick, uh, and that usually keeps pretty well. Um, 
usually out of town, I'll buy a stick of cheese and that'll last me a couple of days. In the heat, it doesn't stand up as well, but if you eat it quickly, it's good. Um, I carry a couple of bags of gorp, um, and it's sort of my own mixture of peanuts and M&Ms and raisins and dates and almonds and sunflower kernels, um, which is a good, uh, good lunch snack type item. Usually out of town, I'll carry um, some sort of bag of small candy bars, either Snickers bars or uh, um, Hershey's miniatures or something like that. Those generally don't last very long. Candy bars get wolfed pretty fast and passed around and the, and, and the whole bit. So um, I always carry a jar of peanut butter with me. Uh, early on, I was carrying jelly, but I got to not like the way um, it gets messy after a time and it gets compacted in the bag, so it makes for sticky bags and stuff, so I stopped carrying the jelly. But I always have peanut butter and crackers with me, always at least for lunch. I prefer for um, breakfast when it was cold, uh, I preferred grits in the South. I prefer grits. I was obligated to wear grits around all these Yankees. Uh, now that it's gotten hot, I prefer cereal uh, with powdered milk and honey. Uh, for lunch, I just eat candy bars generally all day long. I don't really have a set lunch per se. I just eat, just munch on candy bars. Uh, here lately, it's been so hot, my candy bars are melting, so I'm in the peanut butter now. Um, for dinner, I go with, uh, I prefer Lipton's uh, noodles. Uh, they uh, have a whole host of different varieties, perhaps a dozen different varieties, and they're pretty good, and they're inexpensive, and they're fairly easy to find in, in the grocery stores. And then I'll, I'll uh, put a can of tuna fish or whatever in there to kind of spice them up and fill out the meal. It's a pound of butter, and it goes really fast, and I need the uh, calories, and I use more than I need in the, 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 that's asked for in the directions. And uh, it doesn't go bad. Uh, Sometimes I don't use a lot of butter and I'll have the thing out two weeks and it'll be in the sun. You know, I mean, it'll be a warm day and it, it, it doesn't go bad, I don't know why. Also a Citadel spread, which is uh, peanut butter, uh, equal parts peanut butter and powdered milk and a little bit of honey and some bacon grease all mixed up and they make a kind of a spread. You can make it any way, like thinner or, or thicker. And I would make it thick and uh, it would hold in a Ziploc bag and I would eat that. And that was good for me to keep on the calories. It was pretty well packed with calories. Now I just can't get enough to eat after, you know, I, I just can eat forever. Uh, all you can eat uh, food bars in towns and restaurants, they lose money on me. And uh, might be surprising because people keep telling me that I've lost, that I look really skinny and I've lost a lot of weight. Well, I have. I, when I started out, I lost 15 pounds uh, in the first month or so, and then I gained back five pounds. And, uh, and now I've kept it around there. I weigh 150 pounds, and I'm 6'4", and I should weigh a lot more than that. I get all my food, at least the food that I don't yogi from tourists, uh, at stores along the trail. Um, there are quite a few people out there who prepackage a lot of food and have it mailed to them on the trail. Um, I know. Vegemite and Dr. Marmot from Philly are vegetarians. They bought a dehydrator and made themselves a couple hundred meals and are having them shipped to them at various points along the trail about I think, every 10 days or so. I guess they left it with their parents or whoever and a schedule so they know where and when to mail the stuff. And uh, back when I was hiking with them a bit in the Smokies, uh, they had some leftover dinner, which they kindly gave me one night, and it was really tasty. Um, I like a lot of vegetables and they had made a dinner of lentils and maybe some chickpeas or something and it was a really nice dinner. Um, if I had planned my trip more in advance, uh, I probably would have done something like that as it, as it so happens. Uh, I've been thinking about hiking the AT for quite a while but the actual decision I made I think in March of this year and I was on the trail one month later so I really didn't have time to go into a lot of uh, food preparation. Um, I think it would have made the hike a lot nicer if I had. 
I've read that you need something like uh, three to four thousand calories a day at least. Um, a normal sedentary person eats about two thousand, I think. Uh, you may need as much as double or triple that at some times, um, depending on how you feel, what the terrain is, and that type of thing. So I start off the day usually with uh, some grape nuts. If I'm in a big hurry, maybe I'll just have a quick pop tart or even just go out on the trail, have a little water, and then just head out. Um, especially if, it's cr if the shelter is crowded. Uh, you don't want to hang around and eat while everybody's uh, getting ready. So sometimes I'll just push off, do a few miles, and then s settle in and have some breakfast. Uh, I basically eat peanut butter for breakfast. I eat peanut butter for lunch with crackers. I um, eat freeze-dried food for dinner. And occasionally I carry fresh fruit. Uh, fortunately, every two or three days or maybe five days, I have a town that you can pig out on. <laughs> and that's what you want to do. I've settled on some fairly basic meals right now. In the beginning, I carried a lot of canned food with me, tuna, uh, some small cans of canned meat, things like that. But now I've settled down to where it's, it's mainly oatmeal for breakfast. And as you can see, I start put things, putting things into bread bags because it's easier to use them. And uh, these uh, seal-type bags, you know, where you run your finger across and seal them on top, they work great for about a week to two weeks. And after that, they just quit working. So bread bags work out better as far as I'm concerned. So in the morning, I use brown sugar and oatmeal. That's basically what my breakfast is. For snacks, I just can't get enough peanut butter and bread. And I combine that with cookies. So any <laughs> so anytime when I'm, you know, I feel like I'm a little weak, need something to eat, peanut butter and bread or cookies. That's, that's a basic. For lunch, it's either Raymond noodles or, <laughs> Raymond noodles or, like I say, uh, peanut butter and bread. For dinner, I use almost any kind of uh, pasta. It could be uh, macaroni, it could be spaghetti, any kind I get. I just boil the water, drop it in there, and then I'll flavor that with with different kinds of soup or bouillon. I've even used sloppy joe mix, mixed in with that. Uh, I'll thicken it also with uh, instant mashed potatoes. Let's see what else I have in there. That's basically it, soup and any, any different kind of flavoring that, you know, that spices it up a little bit and thickens it up. I can't do without coffee. So I use instant coffee in here. Carry vitamins, take vitamins every day. I guess it's supposed to be good for me, so I do it. Salt, <clears throat> salt and pepper shakers, I had a lot of trouble with them spilling inside the pack. So I ended up getting two match cases and uh, salt in one, pepper in the other, and they work very well. There's another thing is if you're into health food, right now there's not a lot of resources on the trail for finding say specialty health food items like uh, tea, you know, vegetable protein. I have a lot of male drops. That's, see, so I solved the vegetarian problem by working predominantly with male drops. Now, as far as food, that's, uh, that's an item that, uh, or an area that has tremendous variation. We have uh, people that uh, have lived on ramen noodles for the, practically the whole trip. Uh, we have people that cook rather elaborately. We have vegetarians on the trail. And I think the best thing there to do is just to refer to some of the good hiking books and see the range of food. Go visit a grocery store and look at the things that are available and then plan your meal from there. A lot of people will use freeze-dried, others will use uh, items strictly from the grocery store. Uh, they, uh, either one works well, uh, just depending on your personal preferences and the, and the pocketbook. Uh, I would suggest that, that you not buy all of your food before the trip. Uh, uh, I've seen people just get, almost go screaming into the woods after their 153rd day of oatmeal, or in my case, banana chips. I used to love banana chips, no longer, because uh, I ate them every day for six months, and uh, now I don't care for banana chips anymore. But uh, food is something that really is very, very personal, and uh, I would recommend that you try to uh, uh, buy off of grocery store shelf. Uh, and suit your own taste. Uh, try to balance nutrition. 
Uh, but uh, generally speaking, you're going to eat such huge quantities of food that it's uh, uh, not as critical as one would think. Uh, it's fairly easy to get the basic protein requirement. Fats are hard to take. You'll have to do a little planning to get fats, but uh, there are a lot of items that are easy to carry, such as peanut butter and nuts and things like that have a lot of fats in them. And uh, then the uh, carbohydrates, uh, you just need to balance those off from simple and complex and so on so that you'll have a good sustained energy level all day. Uh, most people just heat water for breakfast. Very few people cook elaborate breakfasts. And if you do plan to cook a more detailed breakfast, uh, you'll find yourself getting off later in the morning and getting behind, uh, mentally behind or psychologically behind at the start of the day. And most people try to avoid that and eat something very simple for breakfast. And like I say, mostly just boil water and mix it with some kind of hot cereal mix or just drink tea and eat something, uh, some type of dry things, even Pop-Tarts or things like that. So it's best to be simple with breakfast. And then most people don't even cook lunch unless it's really cool weather. Uh, they just eat uh, uh, some type of uh, prepared foods that it requires no cooking. Uh, most people also look forward to a hot dinner. Uh, and that has no more nutrition, of course, than cold food. But psychologically, it's really important. And I think uh, that's one of the areas you need to c concentrate on is, 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 is good dinners. Uh, things that will be satisfying and tasty and something you can look forward to at the end of the day. It's a real psychological boost on a hard day to think of some great meal that you can have when you get into camp. And so some attention should be given, especially to dinners. But uh, uh, lunches, can you can almost plan as you go along and buy from uh, stores as you go along to uh, suit your taste because it'll change during the trip. And, uh, and you can add, add a lot of variety. Uh, breakfast, keep it simple. Those, those are just basic rules that I found work well on the trail. When you're planning suppers, uh, it sh it's important to plan as simple a supper as possible in the sense that a one-pot dinner that can be cooked in a crowded shelter on a rainy night uh, should be your goal. Uh, thank goodness you don't have that that often. But uh, it's, it's just simple to, uh, I mean, it's just good to keep it simple so that whatever situation you run into, uh, you can handle it without having uh, to disrupt everybody around you and, uh, and cause yourself major inconvenience. And, and you cook some pretty good one-pot meals and then supplement them with other things. Uh, and that's what I would suggest for the trail. The uh, real temptation when you uh, <clears throat> do a long hike like this is to eat really anything uh, that you usually don't touch, um, the stuff that tastes good that's um, full of sugar and fat and uh, because you, you just um, do run a deficit of calories every day so you can really afford to eat whatever you want. I have experienced, however, that um, if I do it and I have done it, um, my energy level um, runs really high for um, I would say an hour after I ate and then drops radically and I actually feel real fatigue um, and that I believe is because um, uh, all the refined um, uh, food um, and processed food gets um, passed through your digestive system a lot faster creates a real sugar high and um, then just poops out. So um, I started experimenting with um, the same type of food actually that I eat, that I eat at home, which is a uh, whole grain, um, you know, like brown rice, um, granola, um, beans, um, dehydrated um, dark green vegetables like kale, and um, have realized that um, I have um, energy over much longer periods of time. And uh, so I made a compromise. I eat that stuff really when I'm on the trail. I'm very good about that. And then when I do get into town, I treat myself to some ice cream and a pizza. But I also have to say that the craving for that has gone way down since I have uh, started eating um, whole grains and, and organic food on the trail which is really interesting. So while um, my hiking um, partners all head to the next P 
pizza place, I usually look for um, a place where I can find some food and, and salads and because that's really what I'm craving. Generally, two schools of thought out here. One school of thought is to go with a little bit bigger, heavier pack and perhaps indulge yourself with equipment, maybe more clothes, more food, and what have you. The other school of thought is to go lighter and a bit more Spartan with your equipment. And I subscribe to the, um, to the latter school where you go a little bit lighter. So I've got a real light pack. It's a Gregory Ultra Light Pack. It's a little over four pounds. As I understand, it's one of the lightest packs on the market. And it's an internal frame, which generally internal frames are, um, are lighter. They um, are generally considered to be more comfortable. However, they uh, make you sweat the wraps on them are. They make you sweat a little bit more. And um, they're not as convenient to pack. Um, but anyway, this is an, my pack. It's a... Um, by the way, I ordered this out of a black and white catalog. All my friends out here give me a bunch of grief about the color of this thing, but I did not know. So that's my, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. The, uh, this pack has a uh, top compartment that you access from the, um, the back here and I kind of keep my incidental stuff like uh, my maps and my through hikers handbook and my data book and uh, toilet paper and my rain cover and candy bars that I eat throughout the day. I generally keep stuff in here that I need to access during the day, which avoids having to access the interior compartment. And the zipper for that is back here. Um, now, as far as water bottles, I don't drink that much water, so I, um, I just have two can to old army canteens, and I also have the old-fashioned military cups on the canteens, which suffices my mess kit. Um, they will hold whatever meal, whatever serving size I need, and they'll fit on top of a uh, stove quite conveniently. And when I can carry them on the outside of the uh, canteen like that, it saves room in pack. And I have a couple of those. Now inside the pack, I try to compartmentalize. In other words, I try to use ditty bags to contain whatever um, stuff I have so I don't have a bunch of loose stuff in here. Another wrap, well, as I mentioned before, one of the wraps on the internal frame is difficult to load and unload. And unload. An external frame has um, compartments and what have you that you can access from the outside of the pack. Well, on the internal frame, you gotta, you've got to go down through the top every time you need something. Anyway, what I've got here is I prefer moccasins. A lot of people prefer tennis shoes or flip-flops. I prefer moccasins for being around camp in the evenings. I have a um, three-quarter length Thermarest self-inflatable mattress. Everybody says, well, they prefer full length because they like for their to have enough length for the feet and what have you. Well, in my size and lack of stature, I only need a three-quarter length Thermarest. Um, this is a little pouch I have that contains my camera and letters and writing stuff and um, also my medical stuff. I don't care, but uh, some tape and some band-aids and some uh, mole skin. I don't have a real big first aid bag or necessities. What I do have is in here. Um, This is my food bag that I uh, is kind of heavy. Because it's the first part of the week. And um, generally I'll carry maximum be um, eight or 10 pounds of food. I prefer to uh, buy food in whatever community or town I'm in as opposed to having food sent to me on my mail drops. I don't like to be obligated to a particular mail drop schedule and I don't like to be obligated to a particular menu. I like to be able to vary my menu and buying food as I go along the way allows me to do that. Now I use a Peak One 
camp stove, which is um, a popular stove, perhaps not the most popular, but certainly one of the most popular. It is a, um, it operates on Coleman fuel or white gas. This particular model can operate on unleaded gas, I understand. Some guys run unleaded gas through their stoves. Um, I prefer this stove because it's a little bit heavier than most of the, um, the other stoves, but I prefer it because you can adjust the flame and it's real simple, it's, it's virtually idiot proof. And you're talking to an idiot when it comes to these contraptions. So, I prefer the peak one. Next I have my, um, my sleeping uh, gear. Initially I started with a uh, zero, degree, zero rated bag, sleeping bag, back in Georgia. It was back in April, and um, then I got a um, higher rated bag, a uh, 35 degree rated bag, and then it got real hot, so now all I have is a little sleeping bag liner and a sheet, which um, suffices fairly well. Here lately it's gotten kind of cool, kind of nippy uh, a couple of nights, and I've uh, had to wear everything <laughs> I'm carrying in order to stay warm. But I prefer this wrap because it's uh, smaller and it's lighter. This is a little ditty bag I have from all of my, um, just my toothbrush and um, pens and cord and just what a flashlight, just incidental stuff. Then I have my, um, well, actually, I wrap up my clothes in this, uh, in my ground cloth. And uh, I wrap up my sleeping bag in a trash bag that, uh, the worst thing in the world is to have wet clothes and wet sleeping bag, in my opinion. And I prefer to take extra precautions to make sure they stay dry. So in addition to my rain cover on my pack and the pack, I'll put them in a trash bag or in my, my uh, ground cloth to make sure they stay dry. Anyway, I've got my clothes here. I personally carry a couple of pairs of shorts, uh, two or three t-shirts, one long shirt, um, one long pair of rain pants, which suffices as my city pants, and two or three pair of socks. And um, then a rain um, jacket. Okay, I prefer to um, carry a tarp. Most guys or most folks carry tents, but seeing as I like to go light and I prefer staying in shelters, I don't tent out very often. Matter of fact, in uh, probably uh, three months, I've tented out uh, three times. So I prefer to go with a little tarp. It's a little nylon tarp. I've got some little stakes here. And the whole kit and caboodle weighs perhaps a pound, maybe a little bit more than a pound. Most tents, so the lightest tent I know of is uh, about three pounds, and most of them are a little bit heavier than that. And that's really um, about it. Fuel bottle, I go with the smallest fuel, one of the smallest fuel bottles available. Um, there again, I feel like, you know, the, the convenience of um, going light with a smaller bottle justifies not having a whole lot of fuel. It is a bit of a pain sometimes to have to hustle up Coleman fuel in town, but um, that's my preference. Anyway, um, totally, first part of the week I think I'll be around 35 pounds loaded down with food. Toward the end of the week I think I'll be, be um, at 30 pounds, maybe a little bit less when I'm out of food. My walking stick, again, that's a cheap choice. This is nothing but a piece of bamboo that I cut from a bamboo grove just outside of St. Petersburg. Interesting thing I'm doing here, each state that I come to, I'm just carving the date and the state as I reach them. So right now I'm in New York. Soon I'm going to be in Massachusetts. Uh, it's a Jansport pack, the Adirondack. I chose that based on price and uh, volume. It's about a 3,600 cubic inch pack, and it costs $90, give or take a little bit. It has four, five outside pockets to it, which gives me quite a bit of variety, plus two inside storage areas. 
Um, if I start on the top here, instead of a tent, what I'm using is a tarp. This is a nine by nine, six mil vinyl tarp. And uh, I have, if I can get one of these out here. I'm also using the, um, using the aluminum pegs. I started out with the, the thicker plastic pegs, but I found out there's so many rocks on this trail that you just can't, can't get them in in some cases. So being nine by nine, it gives me all kinds of room when I, when I put this, put the tarp up. Uh, the way I raise this tarp is I have to have one tree in a relatively flat area to put it up in. And I'll tie one corner of the tarp up to the tree, then diagonally down the other corner, I peg into the ground, plus the other two come down. So it, it looks similar to a half a pyramid when it's up. <clears throat> I also have, uh, on the inside of that, I. I made a ball, a, a knot of some rope so that I could go around the tarp and tie that tight and let some rope hang down inside. This allows me to hang um, no seam or mosquito netting down on the inside of it to just lay over me while I'm sleeping. Okay, <clears throat> in the, inside this, uh, the pack, here I'm using, it's just a Glad compactor bag cover. And a lot of these ideas I got were from uh, Colin Fletcher's book, The Complete Hiker. I've read that thing through completely, and he has a lot of good advice in there. So I'm using a Glad compactor bag as a cover. <clears throat> I made a couple of gaiters out of just some plastic bags, which I put over my shoes. Raincoat I had, <clears throat> it's simply a, the top of a raincoat. I had, the, I had the pants bottom too, but they got so hot uh, I just finally threw them away, and they were a little bit too heavy. I guess that's all I have in there. For water bottles, <clears throat> I just went to a, a five and dime store and um, got a couple of couple of these plastic bottles here. I carry two quarts of water with me most of the time. Just that's about four pounds of extra weight, but it's really convenient sometimes. It allows me to camp wherever I feel like it. One of the reasons I went on this trip was as a camping experience as well as a hiking experience. So I wanted the freedom to be able to stop any time I felt like it. I find a really nice view or, you know, I can set whatever mileage I want. I'm not held to the shelters that way. So I have two uh, one-quart containers of water. I also carry uh, a pint of water right here. That's what I drink of out of as I'm walking along the trail. And you can see it's just an old Hires root beer bottle that I've taped up and I just snap it onto my belt. Um, <clears throat> lower compartments, see what I have here. Here's a <clears throat> uh, 35 millimeter Roly camera. I've had this for years and I definitely recommend carrying a camera with you on the, on the trail just to record your experiences. Uh, a couple of extra batteries. <clears throat> Here's a folding scissors that I use quite a bit. You always, you always need it for something. You never know what it's going to be. Lighters. I carry about five lighters with me, and this is all I've needed. You know, and I'm two-thirds of the way through it, and it looks like lighters are going to be all I need to build fires. In this film can, <clears throat> I carry um, the slips of paper for traveler's checks. So at any time I stop somewhere, I'll stick this in my pocket in case anything were to happen to the traveler's checks, I have the proof that I, you know, that I had those within my pocket. Okay, that's that one. <clears throat> Carry a small flashlight. I don't do too much hiking in the dark, but it comes in handy at night. Boy Scout uh, toothbrush, which just snaps in and out. Extra pen. <clears throat> this is a Polar Pure water disinfectant, and <clears throat> so far I've only used this, uh, I would say, less than 10 times. One of the things I try to do is to always get water from a safe source. Uh, if I can't do that, I want to get it from a spring. Very seldom will I take water out of a stream unless I can see where it's coming out of the ground. And I haven't had any problem at this point. So I, I'm very careful to look for water coming up out of the ground so I know that it's fairly pure. 
And I haven't had trouble getting water. Toothpaste, some more lighters, another pen. I carry a mirror with me and, uh, and my knife, which I've used very seldom. But the only time I use this knife is to carve into the, the walking stick what state I'm in when I got there. Here's a comb, nail clipper. Uh, instead of uh, mole skin or second skin, whatever they call them, I just use waterproof tape. And uh, <clears throat> you can get this at almost any store, and it, and it works really very well. Anytime I, I had something that felt like it was going to be a blister, I'd tear a piece of this off, put it over the top, and that would take care of the problems. This is a windscreen. <clears throat> now, I made this windscreen myself out of, just out of a sheet of aluminum. And uh, you, have, you really should have a windscreen because there's a lot of times when you, you're trying to light your stove or cook with it when it's just a little too windy. So you need something to cut down on the wind. And the, the data book is, is indispensable, especially in areas where it's hard to find water because it'll tell you mileage-wise exactly where to, to look for water. <clears throat> it'll also tell you where to get food. And one of the things I decided to do on this trip was not to have food drop shipped to me through the mail. I wanted to be able to buy my food as I went, so I'd really be independent of where I was. And with the data book, I can tell when the next town is coming up, which way to go off the trail, and how far to go to, to get any food. And the Philosopher's Guide also tells you some of the good spots, some of the, you know, some of the spots to be aware of. So you can, you can very easily hike without having food drop shipped to you. Uh, by the way, I put everything I put into a plastic bag because no matter how you try to keep your pack dry, sooner or later it's going to get wet. So anything that's of value to you, you should put inside of a separate plastic bag. This is just my, um, the book that I write in every day, different things that happened on the trail. I've already gone through two of these. So, <clears throat> so it's one of those things you're going to look back on later on and be happy that you did. Uh, I have postcards here when I get in some spots where I have a really nice camp. And I just sit and fill out postcards and you know, just write about some of the different things. Um, some letters, different things that I've received, again, in a plastic bag. Carry my money right here. I try to, to keep on hand in cash between uh, 50 and $75 in cash. When I start to get below that, then I, then I want to cash another $50 traveler's check. This is an extra spoon I carry. I have one regular teaspoon and one large spoon. That's all I use as, as eating utensil. Okay, this lower compartment is food. I, I'm sorry, this food's on top. This is clothing. I started out with food on the bottom, but I didn't have enough room in here. Eventually, I had to move everything over and swap it around. And that helped to get a little heavier material on top anyway. So this is just a, uh, a net bag that I use as a pillow. <clears throat> and in it, I have a, a spare pair of shorts, bathing suit, and another t-shirt. This is my clothes bag. Um, I carry three pairs of socks. I have another shirt, a long sleeve shirt, which uh, comes in handy sometimes when you're in an area where there's a lot of mosquitoes and you can roll the, the sleeves down. It's a very lightweight, long sleeve shirt, plus a uh, windbreaker jacket, which is a lightweight nylon. <clears throat> I've also got a towel in here, which I cut in half, so to conserve weight, it's just a half of a regular towel. This is an indispensable tool here, which goes along with this toilet paper. <laughs> This is a uh, candle lantern, which puts out enough light to read by. And uh, I haven't used it all that much, but there have been times when I really wanted to do some reading after dark, and it comes in handy for that. I only have one candle. I carried a couple of spares with me for about 200 miles, and I finally got rid of those. Rope for tying up the food bag. Um, rope comes in handy in so many different ways that 
I carried about 75 feet of nylon rope with me. <clears throat> this is something I carried about half of my trip so far before even using, and it's a uh, hammock. And the first time I used it was about a month ago, and it's such a pleasure that now I look for a good spot where I can just set up my, my hammock and lay there and read a while before I start cooking. And the way I do it, I hang it between two trees. I put my bag here, my stove over on this side, and I can sit and make coffee while I'm reading my book and, and just cooling off in a hammock. And I'm really happy that I didn't decide to get rid of this. <clears throat> First aid kit, which I haven't used a bit. Snake bite kits in here. Um, <clears throat> mosquito repellent, knife sharpener, a few things like that. I haven't used anything in this bag. I'm not sure why I continue to carry it with me. <laughs> Here's my mosquito netting. <clears throat> and um, the w this is just two yards of no -seam netting that I got from Camp Moore. By the way, I got most of my materials from Camp Moore. They're about as reasonably priced as anybody is. I tie, the <clears throat> tie one end up to the, like I said, to the tarp, and this I tie to the rope that runs down diagonally down the middle of my sleeping tarp. So I can hang this right over my head and it, it covers up the whole upper half of my body. Does a very good job. <clears throat> this is um, a no hat that I put over my head sometimes when it gets to be real bad as far as uh, the the gnats and the deer flies. And that works out pretty well too. <clears throat> now, in my upper compartment, I have a regular Sierra cup. This is the pot that I cook in. I carried a skillet with me for, oh, I would guess about two months. I used it one time to fry some bacon, and I decided that was a waste of weight, so I got rid of the skillet. If I were going to get another pot, I'd get one just a little bit bigger than this. I'm not sure what size this is, but it's just a little bit small. So sometimes I end up having to cook two meals instead of just one. I have a, a Sevilla stove. It's the only stove I've ever had, so it's hard for me to compare one with another, but I've been very satisfied with this one. You can turn it down <clears throat> to fairly low heat or you can turn it on to where it really blasts away and it does a real nice job. Top comes off, you just fill it right here. I've had no trouble whatsoever with the stove. This is my fuel bottle, it's a one quart bottle. I noticed most people have a one pint, but uh, the quart worked out pretty well because I only have to get fuel about half as often. Now, I've only had to get fuel, I would say, about seven times so far. And, uh, you know, I'm two-thirds of the way through the trip. Okay, here's my main eating utensil, pot holder. I have an eyedropper for for starting my stove, you take a little bit of fuel out of the stove, put it in the cup around the middle, and then just light it, and that primes the stove. Now this plastic bag also is the bag that I put all the food in, tie it up and hang it up in the air in bear country. So it's, it's another glad compactor bag. <laughs> Here's a water bag. <clears throat> Many times when you go down the trail and you have to get water, it'll be a long distance down the trail. So a water bag comes in pretty handy. You need to get two or three gallons of water and it saves a few trips. This is one of those <clears throat> space blankets, which um, I've carried this with me the whole trip. I've used it about three times. The first time I used it was down in Georgia and got hit by a, a real quick uh, hailstorm, and I was glad that I had this. I was wet and shivering, and I wrapped this around me, and, and it really did a good job of keeping me warm.
<clears throat> this is uh, boot wax, about out of that, so I have to get a little bit more of that. Okay, right here I have a, it's, this is about a, a six by six piece of lightweight plastic. The only time I use this is when I get hit by a sudden unexpected rain. And I'll just pull this thing out and just throw it over me and over the, over the bag and find a good spot to sit, you know, and let it run off me and using about 15, 20 minutes of rain's over and, and then I can just, then I'm set to go and I'm still dry. Rather than having to set up my tarp, and it'll keep, it uh, does a real good job of keeping the water off me. My sleeping uh, arrangement is all right here. It's, this is a 3 8 thick foam pad. I have a ground sheet here. And in the middle is um, a lightweight blanket, which I have inside of a plastic bag. Now, I had a sleeping bag with me, which was, um, it was a three and a half pound Holofill <coughs> sleeping bag, which I carried with me and until the, <coughs> the weather got so warm that um, I just decided I was going to send it home. And it, and it had been warm for about a month. Of course, the day I sent it home, it dropped down to 40 degrees that night. So I shivered, <coughs> shivered quite a bit that night. And right now, all I'm using is the, the uh, lightweight blanket, which I picked up. And that'll be good enough until I get closer to New England again. And then I'll have to get my sleeping bag back again. I purified my water as I was going through the Smoky Mountains because of all the use there. Um, but other than that, I haven't purified my water at all, and I've had no problems. Probably gambling a little, but uh, when I get up north where there's more beaver ponds and things, sometimes you have to use those as a water source, so I'm sure that I'll put a few iodine tablets uh, in, in the pond water. This is a pretty important thing on the trail. Make you do a lot of miles. The Walkman. <laughs> I do have the heavier version though. I have this for a towel. This is um, something like a pack towel or a chamois, but it absorbs water and then you can wring it out and it just keeps absorbing water. You don't, it kind of stays moist. It's real light. It's called a sports towel. And then I have far too many clothes, <laughs> but this is my clothes bag. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, I've got a town t-shirt, which is the t-shirt that I sleep in, so it's the cleanest of them all. <laughs> so I wear that into town as well. Um, books that I keep in here. I still carry a fleece. Uh, I have a heavyweight one, a Polar Plus, which I sent home. And we all went to DC for the 4th of July, so I managed to get to REI and I bought a lightweight one for now in the summer. Sometimes it gets cool at night. Plus, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a Patagonia fleece, and it's a lighter weight one. And then I only have one pair of shorts now, and they're canoeing shorts, I think. They dry really quickly. I have a pair of long the climbing trousers that I wear, and that's really just for when I get into camp at night to keep the bugs off my legs, because I've been getting really badly bitten and a couple of t-shirts like this and three pairs of socks. I don't wear liners either. I started wearing liners and I got a blister with them. A lot of people have found that, that they've had blisters with liners yeah. and when they stopped wearing liner socks, they stopped getting blisters. Um, in the other pocket, I've got my toothbrush and a pencil. I like this because you can... You can read with it at night. <laughs> you can read with it at night and you don't have to hold it and you can angle it. It's a good gadget, too. yeah, you can cook dinner with it. And I have a Gore-Tex rain jacket in here as well. It's an REI Gore-Tex rain jacket, which is heavy and I thought about getting rid, rid of it. But if it's cold, it's good for keeping warm. Um, and my latest acquisition... <laughs> Mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> I've worn once. <laughs> this thing uh, is a fanny pack. 
and uh, it just clips. It fortunately it clips onto this pack pretty easily with a couple of carabiners. Sometimes we'll get into town and then want to do some mileage without our packs, so we can leave our packs uh, at the at motel or at the shelter, and then take off with these. Uh, and then get a ride back to where we started from. And that's a good way. A lot of people do that just to save um, some effort on some heavier or some more arduous terrain. And um, that, that saved us a lot of times. <laughs> we've, we've done some easy miles with just this pack. There's a, a number of different guides which people use on the trail. Some, some use them all. Uh, some just go with the maps or don't go with anything and just follow the white blazes, which can be done. We like to be safe, so we carry everything. <laughs> we've got, um, since we're in Pennsylvania, we've got the, the Guide to Pennsylvania, which gives really specific information on where the springs and roads are. Um, so that's good, but we haven't really used these state-by-state um, -state guides as much as as we probably should. And you can really do without them pretty easily. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the Appalachian Trail Data Book by the Appalachian Trail Conference uh, is, uh, pretty much everyone has this. And it's good for figuring out how far ahead a town is, um, water it, where water is. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little more general than these specific guidebooks, but Accurate. But it's for the whole trail, and as you can see, it's it's not very big, so it's, it's usually the most accurate. Yeah, ever that's trail. right. It's the most up to date. So we carry that, and then we have the Through Hikers Handbook. Mm -hmm. This is uh, by Wingfoot, who's hiked the trail a number of times, and it gives really good information, particularly when we go into towns, about where to find uh, uh, food and and lodging. Um, where to buy Coleman fuel, that kind of thing. So really important things that through hikers need to know. Uh, it sounds like a plug, but it's a really good book. <laughs> and it, it also gives some uh, interesting uh, information about the places that, that you see along the trail. And then also uh, we carry a set of maps, which is important. It gives, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, there's a profile of, of the trail. It gives you a general idea of if, if you're going to be climbing or descending. And then the uh, actual contour map, uh, so you can really see what you're going to do. Because <laughs> profiles tend to be exaggerated. Under-exaggerated. Yeah, under-exaggerated. Another luxury item uh, I carry is a, is a book. Um, this, due to limitations on weight, people really don't carry a lot of luxury items, but that's, that's one of them. I carry a full-size 35-millimeter camera with a telephoto zoom lens that also has macro capabilities because I like to take wildlife pictures and um, zoom photos and all kinds of different type of photos while I'm out here. So um, it's a little bit heavier and yeah, it's extra weight, but I enjoy taking the photos, and I figure that this is my only chance to do a hike like this, so um, I don't mind carrying a couple extra pounds at camera weight because the photos and the memories will be there when I'm done. Um, I carry a lightweight aluminum tri tripod also so that when I'm in a position where I can take some wildflower shots, um, I have the tripod, plus it's nice to be able to take, if you're out alone and you want to get a picture on a summit or of yourself against a nice backdrop, it's nice to have the tripod so you can take a self shot. Um, again, it's another extra luxury item that most people won't carry because they're concerned about the weight, but I like to have it and I've carried it this far and it hasn't bothered me, so it'll go all the way with me, I'm sure. But um, I do carry iodine in case I come to a real bad looking piece of water. And I mean, once I was so desperate for water, I, I was walking on a Jeep road and the water was just streaming down muddy and I had my filter wasn't working it was clogged I had no tablets I just took my bandana and filtered the muddy street or road water and drank actually drank it 
but uh, I don't recommend it because it didn't taste very good. But I didn't get sick. I have a, a, a stove that I have is an MSR Whisper Light, and uh, I like it a lot. It's pretty simple. It uh, boils stuff pretty fast. It's um, I haven't had any problem with it. It's clogged up on me once, and I cleaned it, and it worked fine again. Um, the fuel, I have a 22-ounce uh, fuel bottle, and that uh, will take me, gee, I don't know, like 10 days. And that's breakfast and dinner cooking. And uh, I, one time I thought I was going to run out of fuel, and I was cooking on fires for a while. But uh, I could have kept going with the fuel. I just cooked on fires just to be safe. Um, I carry two quart bottles. Uh, I started out with one quart bottle and a canteen, a two-quart canteen. And I finally, along the way, I got a, uh, a water bag, <laughs> which is over here. And the water bag has worked fine. Somebody actually gave this to me along the way. It was nice enough to do that. Uh, the water bag on the inside, it has an uh, uh, inside bag and then an outside container. It has a handle you can hold, put on a nail, which is nice. Uh, you can hold it at different levels. It split on me when it dropped and it was full. It split open, but it's still held together fine. Um, I use the water bag to get water out of streams and springs, and uh, I fill it all the way up, and then I filter out of the water bag into my uh, uh, two quart bottles. And uh, I filter, I have a first need filter, which uh, I got in Wesser, North Carolina, and it's taken me uh, all the way this far, and it just started to clog up on me, and it gets really hard to pump. It's got uh, it did have a pre-filter on it, which I used until it clogged up and I threw it out. I'm, I'm going to get a, a new filter and a new pre-filter in this uh, mail drop that I have here. Um, but it still works. I know a lot of people don't filter their water. Uh, they say they don't bother. They just get uh, water out right out of a spring if it looks good. They say that they make sure that it looks good. It's close to the source. But I don't like to take any chances. and. Uh, I started out with uh, iodine tablets until I found out that they made me sick. <laughs> so uh, now I filter everything, and I think most importantly is that it makes me feel comfortable about drinking the water and that I don't have to worry every time, I don't know, I get gas or something that I got GRD. <laughs> when I started out, I, I tried to go uh, Cheap, cheap, as cheap as I could because I didn't have a lot of money so I tried to keep everything I had and one of the things that I had was this sleeping bag which is just a <laughs> square bag I don't even know what the rating is on it people talk about ratings of sleeping bag and I you know I say I don't know mine keeps me warm to <laughs> maybe 60 degrees and then I bundle up a lot but uh, it's, I don't know, I think it was like a $30 bag and I got a Kmart or Caldor and I always had it and I figured I wasn't going to pay a hundred and some bucks for uh, this kind of, for another sleeping bag, but I might pay for it up in uh, Maine, I don't know. And this is my first aid kit, which has dwindled rapidly and which I used a lot when I started out because I had a heck of a lot of blisters. Um, I don't know what to, I have uh, a cortisone gel cream for bug bites and, and, uh, and poison ivy and stuff. I have the ever necessary uh, mole skin, which I haven't used a lot of because, I don't know, my feet are pretty tough and callous now, but I still hold on to it because uh, you never know when you're going to get a hot spot or something. And I have these sterile pads, which I've had since Springer Mountain, I've never used. Uh, I have alcohol prep pads, which were really good and help, helped a lot uh, for on my blisters. Uh, some people carry um, uh, hydrogen peroxide in a little vial, and uh, that seemed to work well for them, too. And they said it helped get in when a blister was punctured. It helped get in under the, under the blister. Uh, I, don't, I don't carry it. 
Uh, I have uh, tape uh, two uh, gauze bandages and I have a snake bite kit <laughs> which I've been carrying for a long time and uh, I don't know why I, just yesterday after over a thousand miles I saw my first rattlesnake and uh, I just walked w around them and I didn't have to use my snake bite kit but I still carry it just in case and I have uh, some band-aids and uh, an anti-fungus uh, cream, which I haven't had to use. Uh, a lot of people have uh, foot fungus problems and also uh, uh, in the crotch area, they have uh, fungus problems. I haven't had any problem at all, uh, and I, I feel very fortunate. <laughs> if I don't use it twice a day, I don't have it in my pack, except for my sleeping gear, which is my you're my sleeping bag, and I do have one lecture item there, a pillow, a down pillow. It weighs a pound, it's worth it. Uh, some people use their, their clothes to sleep on and that and this, and to make pillows out of, but I couldn't do it for the first month, and so I decided to bring my pillow along with me. Other than that, my other, other only luxury is I got a small little radio that I like to listen to for weather reports, and every once in a while, uh, rock and roll up and down the hills. You gotta be careful though when you do that, because you can't hear the rattlesnake underneath your feet. <clears throat> which has happened one time before already on this trail, and, and I jumped 10 feet up and 10 feet to the left. But uh, <clears throat> I do carry two quarts of water. Uh, in the dry sections here, I'll carry three. I'll take the extra weight. Uh, that's about it. Uh, I do carry a tent. Um, a lot of people don't carry them. The only reason I still carry mine is uh, even though some of the shelters are pretty open, you get up there and there's a lot of bugs. A tent is a great thing to have to uh, keep the bugs off you. Mine tent's about four pounds. It's a tadpole north face. Uh, I really enjoyed it. You can still sit up in it, and, but it's still small enough to uh, carry around. Anything over four pounds for one person, I think is ridiculous. <laughs> There's a few people on the trail that have a stove like this. It's called a zip stove, and it's a wood burner. And basically, it gets your pots dirty, and that's what nobody likes about, the, about cooking on open fires. But that's what it looks like. It comes in two pieces. It sits inside your pot. You put the bottom on like that, and then it has a little baffle here to adjust the the flame, but I never use it. I just keep it out all the time. And then there's a button here. It turns out a fan under there, and that fans the fire, basically. And you, you can hear it. I don't know if you can hear it running. I can hold it near my chest here. But it's been good to me. It runs on a double A. Gets you get about a week of use out of the double A. And uh, some people have had a few problems with them. I don't know. The quality control is so-so, but usually things are field repairable. You can buy an extra motor for it even if you are worried about your motor, but I've had this motor for the 1,200 miles, and I do a lot of cooking. <laughs> I don't cook lunches anymore and, or breakfast now with the heat, I, but I always cook breakfast early on, and my dinners are pretty long cooking meals like lentils, split pea, and barley. Things that take an hour to cook, so I. I turn the fan on, get it boiling, and I can even use candle wax, puts a lot of BTU heat out. That gets the fire boiling. Once it's boiling, shut the fan off, throw some, look for coals or large pieces of wood that people like leaving around camp from old fires. Get it in there and walk away. You really, that's what's nice. If you have to burn small pine, that's lousy because you can't turn your back on it because it burns too quick. I'm quite satisfied with internal frame. The, the only, I guess, big difference is the big, the, uh, the external frame, the internal frame, you've got uh, your back right in the back, so all your sweat will get in. So the accumulation of 17 weeks of sweat will come in there and the smell stay there. So that's why you, yeah. Uh, I carry an ace bandage because um, you know, I never had problems with my ankles or with my knees, you know, I was real healthy, real fit all my life, but you put this 50 pound pack on your back and you walk and you roll your ankle on rocks and you, you know, do this, do that, and you know, you're, you're going to feel it after a while. Going through Pennsylvania, my ankle got sore after a couple of days just from constantly rolling on rocks and I had to, you know, bandage it up every so often just to let it strengthen up again. That's about all it takes, you know, your, your body gets kind of beat up and you give it a little bit of a rest, you know, or put an ace on something and it'll strengthen back up and you'll, you'll be ready to roll again.
Well, when I started the trip, I started out with an internal frame pack, which uh, I enjoyed very much. I started out a little heavy, and I had a, a big pack. Uh, there were several things. There's advantages to both ends of it. The internal frame seems to be a little more comfortable. You have a little more center of gravity. Uh, but there, on the downside of it for me is that it, it takes me a long time to pack uh, an internal frame pack every day. I was watching people in the mornings as we'd be getting ready to start our hikes, and people with the frame pack seem to get out a lot quicker. They're a lot more organized. They could unzip a pocket, pull their stove out, or their sleeping bag, and in the same pocket, put it back in. With the internal frames, uh, you kind of build your pack from the bottom up and kind of shape it and balance it out. Um, one thing about the external frame, it also it, it brings the weight higher. Uh, and for a trail like the Appalachian Trail, I feel that this is the best uh, for, the, for this trail. But uh, another reason why I went to this pack is because, uh, uh, again, I lightened my load and I needed a smaller pack, but uh, I was sweating so much from the internal frame. The, I was, it would cause so much heat on my back that I would actually sweat would run down the, my back and my legs. Also, my body heat would transfer and my perspiration would transfer into the pack where this, the actual pack is off your back, so therefore you're cooler, and if you do sweat a lot, it still doesn't actually saturate through your pack. In general, uh, pack weight should be kept to a minimum, no matter what weight and what strength and what hiking ability. Uh, I have a little saying, don't pack anything that you don't use every day, and I found that to be a good rule. It's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a good rule. And uh, Let me say this about pack weight. I found that in general, people fall, usually fall in the range of 25 to 35 pounds without food and water, and uh, that would be, I'd say, a ballpark figure. Uh, it's good to stay within certain ranges uh, when one is planning. Backpacks, uh, I've seen both internal and external frame packs on the trail about 50-50, and both work well for people. Each have their advantages. Uh, the uh, internal frame pack is much easier to balance and uh, load, and probably is a little more efficient in operation in a trail shelter situation, especially in crowded situations, because they have a lot of pockets uh, and they have easy access. Whereas the internal frame, for instance, a lot of people think that that rides much more comfortably during the day and uh, it's more compact uh, and uh, it uh, has uh, the advantage of being easy to use in and out of automobiles when you're hitching into town. So then there are other factors, but those are some of the uh, things that have to do with uh, selecting a pack. But it's, it's personal choice when it comes to pack as far as internal and external frame. And I think someone should just try both and uh, see what works for them. If they have a pack, uh, probably, uh, and it's been working well for week, weekend trips and for possibly week-long trips, uh, consider using it if it's in good shape. Uh, they, uh, uh, as I've seen with all equipment, it isn't the equipment that gets someone to main. However, it's important to select the right equipment if you have the choices to make uh, before you trip. If you already have equipment and it's working well for you, you'll probably stick with it, but most people that I've found on this trip will actually buy a number of new items, and generally a backpack is one of them. Now, for instance, tents, that's another area. Uh, does, do you take a free stand, standing or do you take a tent that uh, requires staking? Uh, both have worked well on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, I find that uh, in some areas, such as the Whites in New England, it's very good to have a freestanding tent since you're on wooden platforms a lot of times. However, they have eyelets, so someone with a different type of tent uh, one that needs stakes can tie off. They just need to take extra cord. So both of those types work. Uh, some people go very lightweight with tents. Uh, they take the little one-person bivy tents. Uh, you make a sacrifice when you do that. For instance, the, uh, uh, the lack of volume uh, means you can't take your gear in with you at night. Uh, it's very difficult to operate in and out of those tents. However, for someone who is very weight conscious, for, for instance, uh, many of the smaller hikers, and I've, I'm one of those, uh, have to be careful about having too much total weight, so a tent is a good place to compromise. Since you don't use a tent every night anyway uh, on an AT hike, generally about uh, 10 to 20 percent of the nights is, uh, is spent in a tent, and some people go through the whole trail only tending a few times, and some have even done it with no times. Uh, some even take tarps uh, just because it's a, uh, a nice, inexpensive uh, alternative to buying a, a, 
a mountaineering type of tent. Uh, the uh, sleeping bags, the same thing. Uh, the trip is generally cold on each end, uh, meaning cold in Georgia and cold, colder in Maine with very hot weather in between. And the ideal solution there is to take two sleeping bags, uh, uh, one that'll be sufficient for the cold weather you anticipate early, and that depends on your starting date, of course, uh, then to take a lighter weight tent uh, as the uh, uh, weather warms up and getting it up somewhere in maybe early Virginia. And uh, if you can't do that, though, I think the, the solution is to get your colder tent, because it's always uh, possible to sleep under that, just unzip it and use it as a blanket. Uh, and even to sleep on top of it if the bugs are not too bad. Uh, whereas if you have a very lightweight tent, it's hard to get warm in it, and uh, even by putting on extra clothing. So, uh, but that's here again another thing of personal choice. Should you take down or should you take a synthetic tent? Another thing of personal choice. Uh, price usually is the determining factor there, although weight is a consideration also. Uh, both down and synthetic sleeping bags have been used successfully on the, uh, an AT hike. Uh, I've used both. Uh, uh, with no problems uh, either way. Uh, the secret is to, is to keep a down bag protected, and same thing for a synthetic bag, but especially a down bag, keep it protected from the elements. And the easy way to do that is just to use a garbage bag inside your stuff sack. Uh, it's a little extra trouble, but uh, you can go through the whole trip without having to worry about getting a down bag uh, uh, wet, unless your t tent leaks, of course, then you have other problems. Uh, but uh, both work, and uh, the secret there, like I say, is to get, uh, get a a bag that is sufficient for the coldest weather you'll have and then possibly to get a warmer weather bag to use in the middle part of the trip. Uh, I certainly would use a sleeping pad uh, as much for protection from the coldness of the ground uh, as for comfort. Uh, but the two types that are seen most frequently on the Appalachian Trail are the self-inflating thermarest types of uh, air mattresses and the uh, foam, closed cell foam pads. Uh, both work well. One is considerably less expensive than the other, uh, but bulkier. Here again, you have a trade-off between whatever you, uh, qualities that you'd like to get. Uh, Thermarest is quite successful uh, uh, as far as durability, uh, but so are foam pads. Uh, one key I found in planning with either type of sleeping bag is to carry it inside some type of protective sack or either carry it inside the pack, one of the two and uh, that will protect it for the entire journey. Uh, now the stove uh, that you use can, will depend a lot on what type of cooking you do. Uh, most of the major brands of stoves work well, uh, both the uh, white gas types, the uh, butane types, and the al now alcohol types, which are showing up more frequently on the trail. Uh, a lot of people are even using zip stoves, which are, are a type of stove that relies on having uh, wood available, and uh, those have uh, worked successfully also. Uh, the white gas stove will give you the most heat per unit of fuel weight, and seems to be most efficient as far as uh, cooking uh, large quantities of food. Uh, butane is quite convenient, on the other hand. It uh, needs no priming. It works like the uh, gas range at home. Uh, the problem with it is uh, you ha can't have a hard time finding butane fuel canisters along the trail, whereas white gas is very easy to obtain. Alcohol is fairly easy to obtain, but uh, here again, the, uh, the heat output is not as great, and uh, then uh, uh, a lot of people uh, just don't like the simplicity of an alcohol stove. The zip stove has its advantages also, but it also has the disadvantage it creates a lot of smoke. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't require you find any fuel other than just batteries occasionally. Uh, and uh, it is probably going to be something we'll see more of on the trail, both the alcohol and the zip stove. However, all four types work well. Uh, any of the major brands that are on the market work well. Uh, and you'll just need to examine your cooking style uh, and make sure that, for instance, if you do a lot of fancy cooking, and what I mean by fancy cooking is a lot of different types of meals that you have a stove that will simmer well and that will be fairly fuel efficient. Uh, if you cook mainly by boiling water, then uh, just about any of the stoves work well and are easy to handle on the trail. Cook set should be kept simple, but you need to make sure that you have a pot big enough for your biggest meal that you'll cook. And uh, then you can start adding accessories. Some people like two pots or maybe a quart and a pint pot uh, to 
uh, cook a uh, meal and some hot tea or something like that. Uh, couples, of course, require a little bigger cook set. Uh, people that eat a lot require a little larger cook set. Uh, most people keep the cook set very simple, though. Few people take fry pans, also uh, many of the vegetarian hikers. Uh, prefer to have a fry pan because they do a lot of stir fry and things like that. So, uh, and if you want good pancakes on the trail, you'll need a Teflon fry pan. Uh, it's almost indispensable if you do that type of cooking. But uh, cooking style varies greatly, <coughs> and uh, it's uh, uh, that's here again one of the most personal items I've seen among equipment. I've seen people put together. Uh, cook sets out of their kitchen. I've seen people buy very fancy little nesting sets and both work well depending on how the person cooks. Uh, as far as knife, fork, and spoon, generally people take something like a Swiss Army knife uh, which has a combination of blades and gizmos on it uh, and really all you need for food preparation is a blade to cut and a uh, can opener uh, and a few things that uh, I call necessities, but a lot of people don't, such as a corkscrew. And uh, then you need a few blades, of course, on the knife for doing pack maintenance. But as far as food preparation, a blade is about all you need and a can opener. Uh, most people take just a spoon. Few people take forks, especially if they do a lot of frying and pancakes, things of that sort. But uh, just about everybody takes a spoon. I'd recommend a metal spoon. Uh, I've seen a lot of interesting uh, shapes developed from plastic spoons that have had a little too much exposure to hot uh, food and uh, it's uh, I've seen a lot of them break in cold weather so I would recommend uh, a metal spoon uh, nothing fancy just a plain metal spoon uh, that uh, you can get out of your kitchen uh, water is another situation that varies or another thing that varies a great deal from hiker to hiker uh, some hikers drink tremendous quantities of water, others very little, doing the same amount of hiking on the same day. Uh, that's something that uh, you'll have to experiment with. Uh, but I would recommend to start that you take maybe two one-quart bottles, or maybe a one-quart and a one-pint bottle, plus a water bag. Uh, the water bag's very convenient for getting water uh, at springs that are somewhat distant from shelters. Uh, it just keeps one from make, having to make two or three trips back and forth to the spring, and especially in dry weather situations, uh, that's important because you don't want to run down a quarter mile to the spring two or three times an evening. Uh, so I think maybe two water bottles and a water bag. As far as water treatment, uh, there are two primary methods that are used. Uh, one is water filtration, and there are a number of good filters on the market with, ranging from anywhere from about $30 to $200 and uh, the weight varies from anywhere from 5 ounces to 28 ounces uh, on the popular models. And here again, this depends on how much water you want to filter uh, and how much of a chance you want to take. Many of the springs on the trail are uh, flowing directly out of a mountainside. And I know in my own case, and I can't recommend this because each one has to make his own decision, but in my own case, I risk uh, getting uh, some type of contamination and many times uh, just where I buy, but I always select good safe water sources as far as possible and filter or treat water uh, only on those where I'm in real doubt. Now the other method besides filtration of course is treating either with iodine or chlorine. Most of the people that are on the trail use an iodine type of uh, treatment and uh, they come in two forms, either tablets or uh, a crystalline form uh, immersed in water, basically a, uh, an iodine solution. And either type works well on the trail and few people have problems. Uh, they're not recommended for daily use, but uh, people use them every day and haven't had any real problems with them. Uh, so uh, either type would work well. And, and most people either filter or use some type of iodine treatment. Now the one method I've never seen used by any through hiker is boiling. Uh, it just takes too much fuel and uh, that's something that uh, uh, is made best probably left to weekend trips. Uh, I always carry a little miscellaneous and repair kit, a little spare parts for my stove and pack, flashlight, extra flashlight bulbs, uh, maybe some extra batteries. Uh, my sewing kit, I keep in that uh, and find that, uh, for instance, the sewing kit can be fairly basic, but uh, it should have some large needles and some what I call top stitching thread, which is a heavy thread, or you could use dental floss if you want to be really efficient. Uh, just so that you can do pack repairs. If a strap pulls apart in the middle of nowhere, it's good to have the ability to sew it up until you can get into a town and replace it. 
Uh, of course, a thimble it works good. It does here again. These are things you can get probably uh, from your home uh, sewing kit, uh, sewing area, or uh, wherever you get your sewing done. It's real easy to find these items. There's nothing special about them as far as backpacking. They're just nice to have uh, in case you have a, a problem. Uh, you'll need a good flashlight. Uh, a lot of people uh, skimp on their flashlight, but it's really not a good idea. Uh, you very rarely use one. Uh, but uh, when you do need it in an emergency, it's good to have a top flight flashlight, one that will work in all kind of weather, that will take uh, uh, repeated abuse from dropping and things of this sort. And again, you should have spare bulbs for whatever flashlight you have. Uh, I also suggest carrying a candle because uh, many times in a shelter situation, the, uh, you might want to stay up and make notes in your journal and so on, and a candle is uh, uh, very efficient uh, for the type of light you need to do that. Plus, it also interferes less with other hikers. Some hikers have gone to headlamps, especially ones that do a lot of uh, late hiking and get in and cook after dark, or people that even want to do night hiking. Uh, so uh, that's another option. Uh, a headlamp does free your hands to do other things, uh, and that's often handy. Uh, they weigh a little more, and uh, they're not quite as versatile in other, versatile in other ways, but that there are trade-offs there, just like in everything else. Um, Hiking stick is one of the items that I found uh, people either love them or hate them. Uh, I've always carried one. Uh, I find 10 million uses for it. I'm short, so it helps me on in balance on the trail. Uh, and it has a lot of just specialty uses, such as fending off dogs or finding the stepping stones in muddy areas when they're covered. Uh, uh, they're good to lean on when you're talking to somebody in the middle of the trail. Uh, they uh, uh, can uh, be used as a clothesline occasionally. Uh, just uh, all kind of uses, propping up your pack. So I, I like them a lot, but I know a lot of people uh, on the trail uh, just don't want to have their hands encumbered with a hiking stick, and they can be a nuisance in rocky areas. So that's another one of those optional items. Uh, one item that I found very useful is what I call a data pouch. Uh, I usually have a little uh, nylon pouch uh, to carry all my books and maps and journal and uh, any types of paperwork that I have. It's really a hassle to have to fumble through paperwork in the middle of your pack. Things get lost and thrown out real easily. Uh, so I carry everything, including my wallet and uh, uh, other identification, uh, data book, guide book, through hiker's handbook, whatever. Uh, carry it all in one little pouch. And it can be a large Ziploc, uh, which is replaced occasionally, but it's not real durable. But I mean, the large Ziploc will do a fine job. But it's just nice to have everything in one spot, and especially when one goes into towns. Uh, it's nice to be able to have all of your uh, paperwork, including telephone numbers and things, in one spot so that you can walk around town with it and find everything easily. So I would definitely recommend a, a data pouch or at the least a large Ziploc to keep everything in. And get in the habit of keeping all of these items, the miscellaneous repair kit, the toilet kit, the first aid kit, the data pouch. All of these things, uh, keep them in their own separate uh, little containers so that they're easy to find and easy to operate out of. Uh, cameras are an item that uh, most people find uh, to be a hassle on the trail. However, they're indispensable preserving, for preserving a record of the trail experience, and, uh, and most hikers carry a camera. Uh, if, if you're not experienced with a really fine 35 millimeter system, I recommend one of the little 35 millimeter point and shoot automatic type cameras. They, uh, the ones on the market now give good results and uh, most hikers that are not experienced with, a, uh, uh, with an SLR will find that they will actually get better results and use their camera more if they have a simple uh, automatic camera. And uh, as far as slides or film, that's, it depends on how you're going to use them after the trail. Uh, if you're going to show your uh, photos uh, or your pictures, primarily to family and friends, uh, probably uh, uh, prints are better because you can put them in an album and sit one-on-one -on -one with someone and show them. If you plan to show groups, uh, uh, probably slides are better because, uh, well, they're the other way to go because uh, uh, then you have the ability to project into large uh, arenas. But uh, uh, both, both work well. Uh, there's no difference as far as use on the trail just depends on the use after the trail. Uh, as far as a radio or things of that sort, if you do carry a radio, carry one with earphones. Uh, 
a lot of people don't want to listen to your radio at night. So uh, be sure that you have a way of listening to it privately. As far as hiking with a radio, people do it. Uh, others prefer not to. Uh, my only comment is that during hot weather, uh, your only defense against most rattlesnakes that you'll encounter is the sound they make, so be careful about it. And I found a lot of people that uh, uh, don't want the interference of the outside world while they're hiking, but I find the same people will enjoy listening to music or whatever in the evening. And one other <clears throat> use of a radio is if it's a good weather source, uh, and I think I carry one for that reason, and I enjoy listening to music as a side effect at night, especially if I'm uh, in an area by myself or tending or whatever. It's, sometimes it's nice to just to have a little uh, relaxing music of whatever type uh, to uh, listen to right before going to bed. A ground sheet under a tent is a good idea. Uh, a lot of times the ground is very, very wet, and it just helps to keep the equipment clean. Uh, I even use an extra little small tarp uh, so that I can put it in inside the uh, shelters, which are often dirty and muddy, uh, to keep my equipment clean. Uh, that's, uh, uh, it's not hard to keep equipment clean and uh, functional out here, but you do have to take a little extra effort. Uh, as far as a rain cover for the pack, yes, by all means have one and make sure it fits with your pack fully loaded and maybe have a little extra space in case you want to lay, uh, put two or three uh, packages of uh, whatever type of food in on top of your pack and lash it to it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the rain cover will not keep all water out, but it will keep things from getting drenched. And no matter what claims are made, uh, then the uh, packs will leak somewhere. <laughs>
to drink while you're moving while having to stop and pull out a pack, pull out a water bottle out of your pack or something like that. Uh, recently, most of the manufacturers have gone to providing some kind of internal storage or some, some way of putting a hydration system inside your pack. Uh, I was leery of that at first because, frankly, the idea of putting water inside my pack wasn't something that I was really comfortable with, but it uh, does have the advantage in the very hot weather of keeping the water cool for a very long time before it heats up, and uh, it does keep it out of the way so that it's not hanging on the outside of the pack. The other benefit that I like is I um, occasionally have seen hikers carry two of them. One where they put a Gatorade or some kind of uh, a sports drink and another one with water, which is something that I'm actually considering, that you could have two different choices of, of liquids at your access again in a seamless way without stopping, which is the critical factor. I use the uh, fuel tablet stove uh, for uh, uh, fuel. It's worked just fine for me. Uh, availability has been plentiful along the trail. I'm using iodine for water filtration. The iodine is, uh, I'm using is the uh, crystallized iodine. You pour water in the bottle and let it uh, um, dissolve the iodine tablets and it tells you how much water to add or how much iodine to add to each liter of water by capful. So that system has worked real well with me. I started out using tablets but I found that I had to buy tablets very often and they weren't always available. For rain gear, I have something that's relatively new on the market, I believe. It's a uh, lightweight kind of a paper product that, uh, that is waterproof, breathable, and extremely light. It's, um, uh, I've used this on the trail since the beginning. Uh, it's, significantly significantly cheaper than Gore-Tex it's a uh, here's a jacket it's got a hood on it and um, it zips up in the front this weighs I believe well, the whole product weighs about six ounces being a paper product it is somewhat fragile it, it had split on me uh, around the around the shoulder straps uh, I don't consider uh, that was easily fixed by the hikers friend duct tape I did approximately 100 miles of prep work on my boots before going on the trail, put these in, and could feel just an immediate difference. Um, it's not a cheap product, um, but from what I've been, uh, my personal experience and talking to many of the other hikers, um, they're just a, a fantastic product. I have heard from several hikers that they can be a bit hard on the feet um, in terms of its they're not soft, they're a harder product. I, it personally hasn't bothered me, but that's one comment that I've heard from several hikers that has dissuaded them after attempting to use them for a while. For water, um, water filtration, I used, used a couple different things. I started out uh, using this. It's a dromedary bag with an inline filter attached. Um, this is good because I could just fill it up during the day and drink right from it. and at night, I would usually fill it up and I kind of let gravity filter the water for me. You suck on the hose, get it going, and it, it'll fill the bottle for you. I, didn't, I haven't pumped water once on the whole entire trip, and I've been filtering it almost, almost all the time. Only a couple times did I drink directly from the source. Um, so this is the way I did it most of the trip. One of the downsides to this are these most inline filters are expensive and um, to replace them enough for a through hike it would cost it, they're not very cost effective so I switched to a different style of the same thing um, this is ho this is like homemade from multiple parts of commercially made uh, individual pieces this is a water bag available from uh, most outdoor companies this is a filter. It's actually one of the cheapest filters you can buy. Um, it's relatively lightweight. It probably costs around 13 bucks to replace and um, lasts for, I think, I think they say 60 gallons. Um, but I pop the small hole in the bottom of the water bag and the filter goes through, hooks to, the, hooks to a hose, and I use the hose clamp to tighten it on. So I can just fill this bag 
and let gravity do the work as well. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not using energy or time pumping a uh, water filter. And I filter it into soda bottles, one liter soda bottles. Um, I buy soda when I get into town anyway, so I figure I might as well use the bottle. And they're light and pretty much indestructible as well. I um, actually prefer the uh, smart wool socks because first of all, they come in uh, different thicknesses so I can uh, stay within a brand that uh, my feet like and um, uh, you know, just use them according to weather and um, my, the size of my feet. Um, they um, stay warm when they get wet and uh, they just, uh, they, they don't wrinkle and wrap around my foot and cause blisters. So I'm, I'm really happy with, with them and um, they just work for me. I'm still with my first set of socks and that's like um, close to the end of the trip. So um, I guess that speaks for, <laughs> for the quality. Um, this is the lower bottom of a um, one gallon um, water container. Um, doesn't weigh much at all. And this is um, a cut off piece of a, a camp towel. Um, so what I do every night, um, I stay at some kind of a water source, whether it's a spring or a brook or a pond or a lake. And um, I scoop um, water into this big container here, which holds like four liters. And I go to the side away from the water source and I pour some in here and I use this thing uh, to rinse myself off and to get all the sweat off my body and then after and I change into my night clothes which is the silk long johns with um, the silk top and this shirt over it I do not hike in this shirt I hike in, in like a um, uh, kind of like a halter top um, and then I take the clothes that I've been hiking in and I wash them really thoroughly. If I have a big rock, I slap them on the rock and pull them through the water to get the dirt all loosened. And that way I rinse out all the sweat. And um, I do not use soap because that's not um, good for the environment. And um, since it's just ordinary uh, dust and dirt and sweat, I, I don't think it, it needs um, soap. And uh, so I rinse out all the smell and, and, and the dust out of my clothes and I um, hang them out to dry. And um, I do that even if it rains um, because that way I have a set of fresh smelling uh, clothes in the morning. And um, I, I, if it has been raining overnight and they're still sopping wet, I wring them out really, uh, really good and put them on moist and because of um, um, these great synthetic fibers that everybody's using now, um, I'm immediately warm because they take on my body temperature and keep me warm. They're not like cotton that pulls the warmth out of my body. And that way I always feel clean. Um, I, I don't smell grungy. Um, a good honest sweat from climbing a mountain smells different than a week old uh, collection of that. And uh, um, so I can actually be forever in the woods uh, I don't need to go to town. Um, I can really keep um, fairly clean and, uh, um, you know, and not, not have to take a warm shower anywhere. It takes a little bit of self-discipline, but I, um, it's very easy, very easy. Another way to do laundry is um, to put it in a Ziploc bag or in a Diddy bag and then use that kind of shaking motion with the water and the laundry in there to um, get it clean. Uh, we have a small manufacturing company that makes a kind of a new piece of gear that's very different. Uh, we call it the power pack system. Basically it's a pack that turns into a tent. If you were to say sew a harness to the floor of your tent or the floor of your bivy, that's pretty much what we're doing. And it eliminates the need to have to roll up your sleeping bag every morning and roll up your, your ground pad and roll up your tent and then stuff all that stuff in your pack. This way you can basically pop it open in 10 seconds and your camp's almost laid out. You have full access to your food, cook gear, and um, you don't have to worry about your pack. It's, it's still there and when you clip everything back together in the morning, um, you just throw it on your back and you go. This is another piece of gear that probably gets the most comments throughout this whole trip. It's an umbrella. 
Um, I started carrying it in Damascus. It had been raining almost every day for a couple weeks, and I wanted to try something different. I was sweating too much in my rain jacket to wear that, and I was getting soaked without it. So I tried the umbrella, and um, it's nice because it gives you a shelter, a bit of shelter while you're walking. I put my one trekking pole down the side of my pack where I normally put the umbrella and kind of prop the umbrella up on my shoulder and just walk using one trekking pole. And it gives me, especially in, when it's really downpouring, it makes a big difference. At some points along the AT, it's uh, a little bit overgrown, so the width of the umbrella is a little bit cumbersome. But luckily, sometimes you're not in those areas when it's raining, so it's not a problem. Uh, other times, you do have to just put the umbrella down and walk through a section, get a little wet, and then you pop the umbrella back up. Sometimes it's too windy to use an umbrella, which hasn't happened to me yet, um, but I hear that can be a problem. The other issue that is a little bit more controversial is the cell phone. Um, there are hikers that are using them. Um, I was in a shelter uh, uh, camping and a cell phone rang and people had, you know, some real mixed emotions about it. Uh, my personal take is uh, there's a gentleman out here that uh, stays in constant communication with his wife. Uh, it seems like a wonderful way for them to keep in touch in such a, a difficult, long separation. Uh, he's out here for six months. Um, and he does it in a very respectful manner that, that tries to respect other people's privacy and, and doesn't try to impinge upon other people. The other big issue is, I'll tell you, if I happened to break my leg, I would be ever so grateful if someone could call for assistance sooner. Uh, communication devices are here, they're here to stay. Uh, I think it will be an ongoing process of how to do it in a respectful way. Having a phone ring in the middle of the mountains I think is, is a little unpleasant for some of the people that are trying to escape some of that. Um, so a way that it can be incorporated in with being respectful to others I think would be helpful, but I think it's an issue as the cell phones become lighter and more effective we're going to be facing these issues of communications, and, and I don't think that it's black and white. I think there are some definite benefits, um, and we'll just have to see how it progresses. Most of the time, cell phones have actually worked. Some places in the South, the uh, um, availability of service was spotty, I've been told, but overall it's been pretty good, and you know, I think we'll see more of it. In here, I keep my baseball hat for if it does rain. I like to wear a baseball hat so the rain runs off the bill. My hat, which I decorate with little things I find on the trail, like bones and tails and whatever. And if you wear glasses, I suggest you have a hat. This is my third one, but I like this one the best. It's a outdoor research hat, and it keeps the water off your glasses. And if you don't have it, you can't see the trail. And <laughs> you, you can't stop in the middle of the trail when it's raining because you'll be miserable. Poison ivy is a plant. It's all over the trail. Uh, I guess it's easy to recognize, but as dumb as I am, I didn't see it, I guess. And um, now I, I can see it everywhere. Um, you touch it, it's an oil. And I mean, you can't get it everywhere. One of the big problems with poison ivy is you don't die, that's for sure you won't die of it, but um, a lot of people will have uh, poison ivy all over the body and they have to drop down the trail and that is something I was afraid. Uh, the problem with my poison ivy is all around the booth, so um, it takes a long time to cure because the booth will scratch and there's only one thing you should not do with poison ivy is you don't scratch. So I had these big blisters now that I have to, to cover and treat with alcohol, uh, which is not, you know, treated yet, I mean, cured yet. It's getting better now. I know I won't, go, uh, I won't die, so um, I keep going with, with it. It's, it's getting better. The funny thing was, um, <laughs> you were asking questions about uh, advice of other hikers. Well, it's, it's about anything on the trail. You ask a question to 
two different hackers, you will have two different advice. So uh, that's why I have so many products uh, against poison ivy, is <laughs> because I've got, you know, I, I, I didn't have too many hackers. So some people says you should use uh, calamine lotion. Other people says, uh, uh, oh, I want to say a pharmacist. He gave me some uh, aluminum acetate solution. Uh, an old woman said uh, you should put your feet in a solution of, of uh, Epsom salt. I mean, I almost died when she told me that, you know. And um, I, I mean, I've got, oh, uh, uh, Ridge Runner gave me some witch hazel. So sometimes I put everything on the same time. So uh, uh, it doesn't hurt. Uh, I've not had much trouble I've, with the rodents. Uh, the, when I did stay in shelters, I did have a little bit of uh, uh, chewing on my pack, uh, stuff like that. You see a lot of that stuff going on. You just got to, every day, you can't be too tired to hang your food bag. You can't be too tired to uh, uh, hang your pack or unzip your pockets. You, you just need to take precautions, and uh, you won't have much problems out of, the, out of the animals at all, I don't think. I met very few women on the trail, but the ones I had, we were talking about losing weight. And it seems that they lose three or five pounds, and I've lost something like 15. So I've decided that in one journal entry to write that uh, I came out on the trail to do the trail, and the reason was I wanted to lose weight. The funny thing is, though, the other part of the journal entry says, yes, but I lost all my natural padding. So, so what has happened is my backpack is now scraping in places it never scraped before. So I now have these nice little sores on my back, my hips, my shoulders. And it's like, OK. And my little ending comment was, well, I've now lost the Dolly Parton look. Let the rest of them figure out what that was. <laughs>I started out, I did the first uh, several hundred miles hiking by myself. I hike, you know, I like to go light and I am and I am um, a little bit faster than most of the hikers out here and therefore I didn't want to be obligated to hike with a partner that was perhaps a little bit slower than I was. Also, it's very difficult to find a real compatible partner. And so to start out with a hike with a partner that you're not familiar with their pace, or how it is to be around it 24 hours a day, I felt like is you know would be a mistake for me. So I started out by myself, and I hiked for 300, 400 miles by myself. And then along the way, I've hiked with various partners, and we've gotten split up for whatever reason. They took some time off, I took some time off. They speeded up, I speeded up, whatever. The advantages of hiking together, for one, um, for one. The advantages are if something happens, if something happens <laughs> you do have someone who can um, get help or whatever. And um, just splitting your gear. Um, loneliness. Loneliness would be lonely. most people we see hiking by themselves do end up pairing off with someone else. Mm -hmm. um, just a lot more fun sharing the experience uh, with someone. Mm. Anything else? Um, Besides, it is something we've planned, oh, I'd say five years or so, and uh, we finally got around to doing it, so it's that much more fun since we did plan it together. I think one of the main things about uh, being a couple and hiking on a trail, one of the main disadvantages is that you both don't feel the same every day. Physical abilities and things like that are, you know, vary. Um, so, it, uh, as far as taking breaks and uh, how far you go each day, you have to make compromises. Uh, besides that, I think. You have to be really patient, <laughs> which I'm not. Um, you have to give to the other person, which can be hard, because you'll set a certain goal for the day, and that person might not be able to make it, or the other way around, which makes it difficult. So in some cases, you limit yourself traveling together. But 
their benefits. <laughs> Instead of, you'd never be around somebody this much in real life. Right. Um, if you were a couple in real life, you have to go to work. Instead, we work together for, you know, almost, it's like work together. We're around each other 24 hours a day, and therefore, I think if you can make it through living on the AT right. together, you can make it through just about anything Same. because because of the fact that you have to, you know, deal with each other every day and, and, and be able to work together and, you know, work out some type of schedule. That's, that's one of the things we did is in order to work things out, we, we uh, decided to almost like break down the things that we do every day and each person has their assigned, assigned task tasks. in a way so that there isn't a lot of confusion anymore. We both know what we need to do and uh, we're able to set up camp, do all the, all the little chores that we need to do without having any big argument over who's, who's to gonna do, do what and who's gonna go get the water tonight because it's a half a mile down the mm -hmm. uh, ridge or, or whatever. So now that at the beginning these things, you know, it took many miles to work these things out and get them so that you know we're ha having a, a much smoother hike now. Yeah. <laughs> so I only had a month to get everything together. Basically wrote to the ATC, tried to find a partner, which uh, sort of worked out. I wrote to a whole mess of people who were looking for partners and I started out with someone. I met him at Springer. We met a third person right that day and we hiked about two or three days together but they didn't I mean, I just found out the pace wasn't compatible. I wanted to go faster than they did, and because I had a lighter pack, <laughs> because I couldn't fit as much in it, it was lighter. <laughs> so, I we parted in ways, and I've been very happy just meeting random partners on the trail and hiking alone sometimes. My parents have always expected me to have this permanent partner, and when I had read some of the accounts, I think I was was sort of. I had expected that I would have this permanent partner and we could split our tent weight, split our stove weight and this and that and I would say that's the exception rather than the rule. Even people who do hike partners for a long time, I don't see them splitting weights. And that to me was like the big thing with having a partner was, wow, we can split weights because and also depending on how strong our partnership you want to have, you can even get organized about waking up in the morning. I hiked with this couple for a long time, uh, the trail names were Gumby and Pokey and I would stay in a shelter with them. We'd get up at the same time or so, six or seven or whatever. And they would always be out an hour because while he was cooking the meals for both of them, she was packing up the tents, she was packing up the sleeper bags. So it's like they were all packed ready to go because they had that teamwork down. You know, each person had their task where I had to do it all myself. So I, I, t I really admired that. And I w would wonder if next time I do the trail, if I do it again, I would not try and get into some sort of partnership. Of course, they have a different hike, too. They don't have the luxury of, they have, to, every decision they make has to be communal, where I can, I can get to an overlook and say, okay, two hour break. They don't, they have to, you know, so that's the trade off there. It can be difficult. I mean, you know, it's just like living with someone, getting married, you know, you learn everyone's little habits that, that kind of get on your nerves and, you know, you start nitpicking each other and, and uh, it's just, you know, it's important if you are hiking with someone to uh, concentrate on giving distance to each other because uh, if you smother each other, then that's when you're going to start arguing and, and bickering and, and probably end up separating, which, you know, I did ended up separating, not from a fight or anything, you know, it was just, it just kind of happened and I was separated for probably probably 700 miles we were apart and then just just recently got back together so but we have our own equipment now so it's you know it's not a definite that we have to be together every night and, and as far as that the reason why I'm, one of the reasons why I'm hiking with a partner is um, I really didn't want to do the trail alone I mean it's a lot of people want to do it alone they think that that's the experience that's the way it should be um, I was a little uncomfortable doing that uh, one because uh, I don't feel safe in cities. Why should I feel safe in the woods? I mean, there's as many crazies there as there are here. Um, and I would rather hike with a partner. It's safer than most city streets. Uh, the incidents that you do hear about get 
publicized because it's supposed to be a nature trail, but uh, it's a very, very safe place, I, I believe. What are you gonna do? Stop hiking just because there's been a couple people killed? We don't stop driving because someone died in an accident, so. Chad is usually ahead of me. When he gets to a road crossing, he waits for me. And I know a lot of the women who have been hiking it on their own, they'll wait in the woods until there's no cars, until they go across. That seems to be the only place that people get worried or concerned, is you know, at roads where somebody could follow you back into the woods. Um, we haven't had any problems, and generally you just don't think about it. You know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, you know, and you don't sort of dwell on the bad things that have happened on the trail. We don't tell people where we're going. Um, that's gotten people into trouble in the past, and, and generally we just say, well, we're just going to go as far as we can go, um, uh, not giving any specifics to people we're not sure of. And uh, uh, we, we do carry mace, uh, just a little, do you have that? Yeah, I've got, um, it's just a little, um, it's not for people though. <laughs> yeah, we carry it mainly for dogs, uh, we've heard there's, we've had problems with dogs, yeah. we've been chased a lot by dogs, but, you can get that at, at most, uh, fishing and hunting stores, or, somebody recommended it, yeah, right? so that someone, yes, Past hikers have recommended that we carry at least that. And we've never really needed it. No, never needed it. Sometimes when you're alone, I guess you might get a little nervous if you're close to a road or something, but most of the time you're with, within reach of other people on the trail, so you always have a security. I, I always feel secure when there's other people around. And, uh, I've never felt scared anywhere. The only reason the perception is that is dangerous, or relatively so, is because of all the, the hype in the media. I think that, um, I also think that to come out here with a, uh, either with a weapon, a gun, or a knife, or being paranoid is to dilute the experience. I mean, I don't carry a gun or a weapon in town, and I for sure wasn't gonna carry a weapon out here. The experience, it's a peaceful, it's a non-aggressive, it is a serene environment, and I wasn't going to disturb that experience by being overly concerned with some sort of security problem or crime. You know, people look at you kind of strange when you come into a town because you're all dirty and you got this huge pack on your back and you're doing something that they can't understand. You know, most of the people in these towns that you come across have never even been in the mountains that are a mile or two away. And you've been all around You've been in mountains for hundreds of miles, and it's very strange to them. So, you know, I think they're more threatened of you than, than <laughs> you are of the town people. People ask me, was I going to take a gun or mace or a knife? And uh, I said, no, because <laughs> one, it's extra weight. <laughs> it's something that I really don't need, I don't think. Uh, I, I, and I, I really, I'm not planning on, wouldn't plan on using it. Uh, two, if somebody wanted to kill me, they'd kill me, uh, whether I had the gun or not. Three, having a, a weapon, I think, uh, causes more problems, would cause more problems uh, than if you didn't have one. Uh, you know, if you pull out a, if you get to a situation where you pull out a gun or a weapon, somebody's going to get uh, hurt, uh, and maybe somebody didn't have to get hurt, you know? Yeah, I think the most dangerous person I've met was a drunk at a bar in Duncannon, um, and the, the bartender cut him off, so he couldn't get any more dangerous. Uh, but they are out there. Um, the problem is, of course, you don't know where and when. So you can't always let your guard down totally, at least I wouldn't. Um, Go out there and have a good time and enjoy the wilderness, but keep in mind that um, because the trail is so accessible by road and a lot of people know it, um, especially people who live near it, um, there, there may be an occasional character out there who uh, you hope you never have to meet up with. They say that uh, your walking stick or your walking, walking staff has about 200 and some uses. Uh, I, I've never thought about using it to defend myself, but uh, if it came down to that, 
Uh, I, I think this would be a very good weapon. Um, uh, I've used this, and, and I, it's saved my life many, many times in river crossings in Maine, and it, it's been like a third leg for me. I've used it to pole vault across rocks. I've used it uh, for balance, uh, going across narrow bridges. You name it, I've used it for that. And, and it's like I say, you could beat something pretty solid with this. And uh, for protection, I, I think it would be great. Uh, you knock somebody over the head with this, and, and then they'll feel it. Um, one of the things I try to do when I set up my tent, I mean my tarp, is to try to get a spot that's a little bit away from the trail and out of sight of the main trail or out of, out of sight of any roads or any civilization. Uh, while I was in the Shenandoah Mountains, uh, I was arrested for possession of a firearm. Um, in the beginning, I thought that I needed to have a firearm. I was very concerned for my safety. Uh, but in short, uh, I was caught with it. They, they arrested me. I was fined. And I have now traveled, uh, I don't know, 800 miles or so uh, without it. And there has not been one minute on this entire trip that I have needed it. I have felt that my, I've never felt that my safety was in jeopardy. Uh, it, it's just that, you know, you have all these, these thoughts in your head of what might happen, what could happen. Uh, there's, I don't think there's a safer place than the Appalachian Trail. And there's no need for firearms. Uh, that, that's just a fact. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have one now, and I, if I had it to do over again, I wouldn't bring one at all. I had a guy this year, um, Woodchuck, and we have a new name for people who do it in two years or more. We're um, kind of specialists. We're called sectionist, and I think it's a little better than the through hiker. <laughs> that way you get to meet more people. The first year you meet a great bunch of people and then you come out the second year and you meet some more people and you can do it in the winter and experience the trail in the winter and some sections get really hot you know so if you're not if your job doesn't allow you to do it in one year that's a great way to do it even two weeks at a time we when we started this we were stationed at Fort Benning Georgia and my husband was in the army we had actually he retired now after 30 years in the army but um, it was very handy to go up there in four hours and, and hike a weekend and come back and up a weekend and come back. And pretty soon you start getting a little bit further each time and all of a sudden you just can't do it in a weekend anymore. So then it became a three-day project and then it was a four-day project. And then of course a lot of our time that we could take was when he was available to get away from his job at the hospital. So pretty soon we're up into North Carolina, then it becomes the Shenandoah, which was a week, another week. And along the way, then one project we had two years ago was to go up and do New Hampshire. And that was our project for that summer. And we were able to get 30 days because, again, at that point, he had just retired. So we've run into a lot of, of super people along the way. And our advantage has been, I think, that we could go ahead and pick the time of year we wanted to go. Uh, we did the section up over Hump in September when it was just the gorgeous fall colors that most people just don't see when they're slogging along through there along in, what, April or May or whatever it might be. Uh, the Shenandoah we thought would be beautiful sunshine and we ended up with hail and snow so you, you can't figure it but yet at the same time and we run into people that shuttled us and we've hitchhiked and we've taken buses and and different ways getting out and around but people have really been great doing it and it, it really helped us all the way. I started the trail uh, from Springer Mountain with a full pack of about a little over 50 pounds and uh, struggled with that for about 500 miles right through Damascus. Um, I met a, a fellow along the way and we started a discussion about how we could uh, finish the trail on time and make life a little bit simpler for us. So we devised a plan to use two vehicles and do a shuttle uh, situation where or a hopscotch with the vehicles where we leave a vehicle at the beginning of the day and one at the end of the day at roads and we would hike uh, from the beginning to the end, get in that vehicle, go back to the beginning and get that vehicle and then hop to point C and start it all over again. By doing that, we've been able to use um, slack packs, which have kept, this is probably less than 10 pounds versus the 50 pounds that I was carrying. The, uh, the benefit has just been an unbelievable because uh, before when I was going up vertical mountains, uh, I was struggling. I was 
having to stop constantly to catch my breath. I was uh, just exhausted at the end of the day. And since we've come to this method, uh, I found that I can almost bounce up mountains. And I've also increased my mileage from about 10 miles to a day to well over 15 miles a day. And what it has enabled me to do is um, I'm sure now we'll be able to finish before October the 15th when uh, Katahdin closes. Some of the advantages that we found from this method, besides the obvious of being able to hike a lot easier, uh, especially on, in mountainous country, uh, is the fact that we are traveling by vehicle in the setup stage through various towns that most of the other uh, through hikers don't get to experience because they're just simply out in the wilderness. The major disadvantages that we've run into, of course, is just the logistics of trying to move vehicles on roads, finding the roads uh, with sometimes not the greatest maps in the world. Uh, that, can, that can be a bit of a problem. And uh, a little bit of the lack of camaraderie sometimes in shelters or at campsites with our fellow northbounders. Uh, we don't get as much of that uh, because we're in our vehicles at night. Well, slackpacking is still, you're still doing the trail, only you're doing it with, with, without the weight of a full pack. Um, you, and you might be hiking north to south or opposite the direction you were originally going. But then, yeah, depending on where you get a ride to. Um, so you can, say, hitch a ride and go up 20 miles. Uh, and then hit, and then hike back into town with just a small pack. Or get someone to take your pack up there yeah. for you. Yeah, or another way it works is that uh, sometimes people will offer to take your pack up ahead to a town, and you can uh, do some easy miles into town. So we've become big fans of slackbacking. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, we still think it's it's doing the trail though. Yeah. Some some people say that's cheating, but but we don't see a difference between, you know, we're still hiking the miles. Um, it's just doing it without the weight. I do take a dim view of that because I think this is really, <clears throat> it's supposed to be a backpacking trip, not just a walking trip. But on the other hand, don't meddle in other people's hike. If that's good for them, then it's really none of your business. So while I do take a dim view of it, I, I used to mouth off about it. Um, I still write an occasional comment in the register. I think the other day I wrote that slack packers are wussies. I try not to give people too much grief about it anymore because it's really none of my business. If they want a slack pack, um, I guess they've got their reasons. It's not, I wouldn't do it. I did it for one mile down in North Carolina at Fontana Dam when I didn't realize what a heinous sin it was. Uh, now that I realize it, I don't do it anymore. The one exception may be up at the end at Katahdin where I understand that virtually everybody walks the last few miles and they leave, the, they leave their packs at the ranger's office or something like that. But for me, for my hike, it's a backpacking trip, not a slack packing trip. And I'm going to carry this sucker wherever I go. I started in the north and I was going south and basically my uh, walking through the wilderness section of Maine, uh, I was very, very happy just to see another face. Um, I didn't see anyone at all. Uh, I met Jeff Healy five, five days out of Katahdin and it was like when I saw him my face just lit up. He was a through hiker that started last year in November and his trail name was Incense. And I, I really enjoyed talking to someone and it was like, it was, it was, it makes, it seems like uh, being away from people for a while makes you appreciate people that much more and, and, and I find that uh, that was a real experience for me going from, from north to south. And another reason I chose to go from north to south is basically I wanted some, some seclusion and I wanted to be away from people for a while. Um, a lot of people would uh, tend to want to discourage you from doing that. They say the bugs are bad, uh, it's very swampy, and, and, and I guess they're right. Um, it was very swampy. Uh, I, I kept my boots relatively dry hopping from rock to rock. and. Uh, um, sometimes my feet were already wet, so I just kind of just plowed right through the swamps. But uh, um, the bugs weren't actually too bad. I started in, in, um, on May 16th, and I climbed Katahdin, and uh, it was very cool most of the way through Maine. And I found that the bugs weren't too bad, especially if you kept moving. 
Um, at night, it would cool off so much that the bugs wouldn't even be a problem. I, I find they're more of a problem over here in the su further south. Um, I wanted to avoid the mass of people going down. And uh, I, I don't know, in a way it adds to, to the trail experience, but in another way it can really take away from it, having too many people around all the time. So that, that's one reason I didn't start there. And another reason is I, I couldn't get there early enough. Most people will start in, in March, and I started in May. I had no other choice. I got out of school. It was, it was like uh, the 3rd of May, and then I still had to get out there and everything else. So I, I couldn't really get started till about the 15th of May, and that was my goal was to get started by then. So uh, if I would have started in Georgia on the 15th of May, I, I wouldn't have gotten up to Katahdin uh, uh, till October or maybe November even. And, and that would have maybe meant flip-flopping so I could climb the mountain. And uh, that's another reason why I'm going south. And going south, I can really enjoy it. If, if the days get really, really hot, I have no time limit. I can spend the whole day at the lake or, or do whatever I want to do. So that, that's kind of nice for me. There are a lot of people who are purists on the trail, even to the extent of not taking shelter loops. In other words, a lot of times you get to a shelter that's, say, 200 yards off the trail. If you're a northbounder, there'll be one path going in. And then there's a dish, another path for, say, southbounders. So it's, in other words, it gives you a slight shortcut into the trail. While if people, I've hiked with people who, if they take one, one path in, they'll take, make sure they take that same path out. In other words, they won't take a shelter loop. And I'm like the other extreme. I'll take shelter loops. I've taken town loops where I've gone into town on one road, gone out on another, and maybe cut a mile off the trail. But and it's funny because people who are not people who are purists can't really understand my point of view. They can't. It seems it's like, well, if you're not going to hike every blaze, why even be out here? That's sort of what they say. And I don't. <laughs> I sort of understand their point of view. I guess it's very. There's something about being a purist that's very easy to. Some I can relate to it, but it's just not for me. Uh, I decided to hike the trail in 210 days, seven months. Uh, because uh, I figured this would be the kind of thing that, that you want to absorb, take in, take your time, do some side trips, um, spend a little time in some of the towns. Uh, the, the hardest thing that I found about taking such an extended trip is that you really become homesick. You really miss your, your loved ones, your, your wife, fiance, your, your mother, uh, your, your friends. You just miss everything. Uh, that is the biggest problem of taking a long trip, but you get the most out of the trip going at this rate. You can, you can take the shorter days and uh, really take your time on these cliffs, these uh, beautiful streams, and you, know, you can really, really enjoy your trip this way, I feel. Most people seem to think they need to get it done in four to five months, and they're coming right out of Georgia doing 15, 20 miles a day, almost every single day. and. Uh, that, that really brings me down to have to hike every single day. And so this is, this is best for me. On the trail, I, I guess in terms of what's the best way to hike the trail, I don't think there's any one best way. That's the beauty of the trail. Uh, whatever your needs are, uh, do it any way you want. You know, I, I have a tremendous respect for a man who, because of family responsibilities and job responsibilities, can only devote one week a year at a time for his hiking and he completed the trail in 39 years. Uh, that's the way he had to do it. Uh, on the other hand, I also have respect for these people who go out to test their stamina, you know, like the fellow that, uh, the runner that uh, did the trail in 52 days this year and the walker who did the trail in 55 days. I also have respect for them. I have respect for anyone that's out on that trail regardless of whether they're carrying weight or not carrying a weight. And really, the only distinction that I make is uh, if people are abusing the environment, if people are abusing the plants, the animals, and also if people are abusive to the other, their fellow travelers. That's the only distinction I make. So when, when you're deciding how to hike the trail, you're going to have to hike your own hike. And to me, as long as you don't abuse or exploit the ecology and the environment along the way, uh, do it any way you want. That's the beauty. I think there's just too much uh, stratification in real life about what's the right way and what's the wrong way. And I think the beauty of the trail is that we can have that freedom to do the trail according to 
our needs. In 99, I had the big pack and it was 40 pounds maybe going into town, uh, which was felt light at the time. And coming out, you'd always pay the price, you know, with all the food and the water and the fuel. And this year, I weighed my pack before I left Knoxville at the post office. It was nine pounds and two ounces without any food or water in it. And uh, I rarely carry more than two or three days worth of food at, at a time. So I'm looking at a heavy day, maybe 15 pounds now. A lot of people mistake me for a day hiker. Uh, other other through hikers think that it's uh, you're cheating somehow. I had a large internal frame pack that weighed six or seven pounds anyway. And I shopped around for the, a small, efficient, lightweight pack. I found one I liked. Uh, I got rid of the big polar guard bag and went to Goose Down strictly for the savings in weight. Uh, I, I got rid of the inflatable mattress and just went with a three-quarter length uh, foam pad. I use the solid fuel stove now, which is much lighter and more convenient. Uh, I have the titanium pan. I don't carry a water filter. I use a, a chlorine treatment. And instead of a three to four pound tent, now I carry a tarp that's 12 ounces. And uh, it's, it's much roomier and enjoyable for me. And that's pretty much the extent of my gear. You know, I don't carry any toys. I see people carrying uh, GPS, cell phones, radios, books, games, cards, you know, anything along that line. I just, uh, I don't carry any of that just because of the weight and I don't really feel like I need it out here. I started out with a t-shirt, shorts, uh, liner socks, running shoes. I had a nylon suit which I've got the top on and a, a lightweight rain suit and a couple of spare socks and that's all the clothing I carry. And so far, you know, I'm sticking with that because it hasn't got cold. At, uh, at some point, I'll, I will pick up a, a long capoline top and bottom and a hat and gloves and you're talking about, you know, another pound maybe. A southbound hike is a great way to go. The, the weather is so much better. You, you don't have to deal with 100 plus degree days. The bugs are gone. You know, the colors will be coming in soon. And there's not many people on the trail right now. Previously, I wore uh, fairly heavy leather boots, and at the time, I was satisfied with them. But I saw that's something that I could make a major improvement on. So uh, this past season, during my job, I experimented with different lightweight footwear, and I, I found some that I was happy with. And I've, I've worn them so far on the trail and been really pleased. Uh, it just it's so much easier, and you know, you don't have two or three pounds on each foot. Uh, it, it makes for additional mileage every day for less work, you know, it seems to me. And rain, a lot of people worry about the rain, and if you got heavy leather boots and you get them wet, you know, you're looking at three or four days to get them totally dried out. And sure, I'm soaked, you know, through on these, but by noon the next day they're dry, so. That's kind of the payback, you know. And, uh, plus price. I mean, you can buy lots of running shoes for what you pay for a pair of uh, leather boots. One of the main differences between this trip and the last trip is my pack is 20 to 25 pounds lighter. Has made a huge difference in the way my hike's going. I, I feel better. I'm able to cover more miles with less fatigue. Alcohol, so this one weighs probably less than one ounce. Two soda can bottoms that have been shoved together and glued with epoxy and have a series of 20 very tiny holes in it to act as jets. Basically have two options. One is to use denatured alcohol which you can get at a hardware store and, very, and increasingly more of the places that have 
outdoor shops and places that serve hikers needs have denatured alcohol available. But primarily I use gasoline antifreeze, methanol gasoline antifreeze, one to one and a half ounces a day. And I only, I basically only cook once a day. And just about any, any uh, large grocery store or a convenience store or a gas station has that available. I carry an eight by 10 t nylon tarp. It's the silicone treated nylon, which is a fantastic product. Uh, it's super lightweight, durable, and absolutely waterproof to, to an amazing degree, much better than I think the, many of the fabrics that are used in other tents. Uh, its downsize is, of course, that it's not flame resistant at all and quite frankly could burst into flames if hit with a spark. So uh, cooking under, under your tarp is very much not recommended. But uh, otherwise it has been exemplary. Uh, the 8x10 size gives me a huge amount of dry space in the rain. I'm easily able to pack everything. I mean, I should take everything under the tarp if it's raining and completely pack up everything except the tarp before I leave in the morning. And the same thing if I come to a place where it's raining, I can put the tarp up and get underneath it and unpack and not have, a, not have to worry about the rain at all. Depending on weather conditions, I'll pitch it differently. Uh, if it's really hot and I'm not really expecting rain, I usually pitch it up off the ground to increase the air circulation which is really the advantage of the, the tarp is that it can be reconfigured so many different ways depending on weather, whereas with a, with a tent you're pretty much restricted to how you can put it down. I actually have a six ounce bug net that I can suspend from the inside of the tarp and has proven very useful here in Massachusetts as the bugs have been a little vicious lately. Uh, and again, it gets, it's flex, that gives me some flexibility. When the bugs go away, I can send six ounces away. The tarp still works fine. I don't have, you know, it's an interchangeable part of the system. Conversely, at the beginning of the trip in, in April, I didn't carry a bug net because it wasn't necessary. So I was able to eliminate some weight and only carry it when I needed it. For weight and uh, financial purposes, I do not carry a tent. So um, while we're in buggy areas, I use a, they call a, it's a bivy bug screen. Um, it's it's kind of like a, a dome tent. It's got poles and everything, but it doesn't cover your whole body. It covers your head, so you've got headroom to move around in. For the stove, I use uh, denatured alcohol. I've got some chicken wire. Um, found it in a hiker box, but you can probably go to a local hardware store and uh, place it on the outside. And what that does is, is that'll hold the pot on top of it. Very light. And on windy days I've got a windscreen. And what that does just keeps the, the wind off of the off the uh, stove. I guess the, you call that a stove. It keeps the wind off the stove itself. And this is um, cookie sheets. Uh, aluminum cookie sheets. I bend it nice and tight and place it around. And uh, Go do something else. No, now you're cooking. If you take the stove apart, there's uh, three parts that um, make up the stove. It basically takes two and a half or three aluminum cans to do it. Um, this is the bottom piece of an aluminum can. Just slice the top off. That's one part, simple enough. Um, this piece right here, same bottom. All you do is you cut out the ring, as you can see the, the ring's cut out, and you add some holes around the top, about 12 holes around the top and 12 right here on the side. And then kind of make some cuts, say about half an inch around, just so the, so the piece will fit in nice and snug and you want those holes to be exposed around the ends. This, this piece right here is the middle of a can, just sliced and its purpose is to fit in this ring here in the bottom, get a nice snug fit in there. So you overlap it, cut some little slots here in the bottom also so that the, the gas can, can um, go to the outside of the stove, or the outer ring. And you put that in the middle and place this on top. And now you've got a, you've got a chamber here in the middle and you've got two little channels you pour the fuel in, and the fuel will go to the outside. So when you light it, flames will come out of these holes like a burner.
I get asked a lot, you know, how, how it's possible to uh, hike this kind of rough terrain with um, lightweight shoes like that. And uh, what really happens is that when you um, wear lightweight shoes, you don't have to um, carry as much weight, like, um, you know, a, a good set of leather boots. So you, your feet are a lot more nimble. Um, you place um, your feet automatically um, a little more carefully. Um, again, which being nimble allows you to do that. Um, and since you, uh, if you, if you kind of add up how many less pounds I'm actually lifting with all those footsteps I do every day, that's an enormous amount of weight. Somebody said something like 500 pounds or so. Um, and uh, when you um, have less weight on your feet, you can hike faster, uh, which means you cover more miles. And um, having a lightweight pack on your back um, also, uh, you know, doesn't, with your body being lighter, there is no need for heavy footwear. And um, in terms of rolling my ankle, I have, um, not rolled my ankle any more or less than I would have done in my boots. Um, my, my feet are used to that and uh, I think that again goes hand in hand with a lighter pack and uh, being really quick on my feet and having better balance that way. And I also feel a lot more connected to the ground. When you wear like a really stiff, um, a boot with a stiff sole, uh, you basically plowing um, through the trail with feeling rocks and, and, and roots more, um, I, I really look at the trail very differently and place my feet very differently and therefore actually have less wear and tear on my legs. So, um, and on the shoes basically too. My pack, the base weight they call it, people call it, uh, without food or water or fuel is, um, before I left it was right around between uh, somewhere between 13 and 15 pounds and that was with winter gear at the time and then um, you know you add, add food and fuel and water and it's usually right around 20 pounds between 20 and 25 depending on how long of a stretch I have ahead. Um, one of the benefits to carrying a lot less weight is it's I forget that I'm wearing my pack not because it's comfortable or for any reason like that necessarily but because it's so light that I just literally forget it's not it's not cumbersome at all um, it I can concentrate on what's going on around me I can look around I'm not concerned with where I'm stepping I um, wasn't too sore you know from carrying too much weight uh, I was allowed, I, it enabled me to go further if I wanted to, to take my time getting places if I wanted to, because it, it just, it's liberating almost. You can, you have more options the less you carry, I think, the less weight you carry. Um, it, it allowed me to switch into lighter shoes so I didn't have to worry about boots and blisters. I think I've had two blisters the whole entire hike. For a pack, um, basically using a super simple rucksack-style backpack um, that are made. It's made commercially. Um, it doesn't have a hip belt. Doesn't have a frame. Um, it's just basically shoulder straps and a hollow body pack with two side mesh pockets and one big front mesh pocket. Uh, this is one of the biggest ways that you can save weight between this and a tarp. Most packs um, can weigh, you know, I've heard people with packs, empty packs weighing as much as 10 pounds, from five to 10 pounds usually, an internal frame pack. Whereas this pack empty weighs roughly 13 ounces. So that's a big chunk of weight. Um, I've made my own pack as well and didn't trust my sewing for a long distance trip, so bought a commercially made pack similar to the one I made. With a pack without a frame, uh, how you pack it is a bit more uh, important. For example, I fold, the first thing I do is I fold my thermarest in thirds and slide that down the back of the pack to give it a bit of support. 
um, it's almost as if my, fr my therm arrest is the frame for the pack. And then uh, my sleeping bag goes in the bottom, and food and everything else on top, pretty much the same way you would pack a normal pack. Uh, but you just have to be more conscious of it's right up against your back, so you're going to feel things that you may not feel with a pack that has huge back pads and hip belts. Um, so you just have to be careful, you know, you don't want your cook kit popping through and getting you in the shoulder blade. For a s sleeping system, um, I use a combination of a couple things. I use a silk liner, um, a homemade quilt that I made, and a Thermarest, uh, three-quarter length self-inflating pad. And the, the quilt that I made has a foot box. It's just sewn. There's no zipper. Um, when it's warm, I put my well, I don't put my feet in the foot box. I only use that when it's cold. Most nights, though, I am in the silk liner. Um, and this quilt just kind of wraps around the top of you and Velcros to the bottom of my thermarest, which I've glued the opposing side of the Velcro to. Um, but again, when it's warm, I don't necessarily even Velcro it. I just kind of drape it over me. That's the nice part about having the quilt is that it can kind of just lay over you, or if you're cold, you can hunker down inside of it. And um, the silk liner, they say silk liners add nine degrees of warmth. The weight of the silk liner is, I believe they say, um, five or six ounces. So, and the quilt is ripstop nylon and um, a 1.8 inch layer of Polar Guard 3D, probably about tw 12 ounces. Um, it's pretty lightweight and it compresses relatively small. And this Thermarest is, I think, they say 16 ounces. I started in March, so um, for a bit I carried this and used this actually as a liner inside of a summer bag through the Smokies. Um, got a little snow and I was glad to have both. And I sent home the summer bag as soon as I got out of the Smokies pretty much um, and was, have been fine ever since then. Sent home the summer bag and picked up the silk liner. That's where that came in. So, um, but I would definitely limit this in combination with the summer bat, with the silk liner to probably around uh, 35 degrees. But I wear all my clothes too if I get cold. So pretty much a standard throughout the whole trip, I've carried two pairs of socks, um, just normal hiking socks, uh, synthetic wool combinations, um, a snow hat. Um, like a beanie, some people call it. I always have this. A couple bandanas. Um, I also wear, use a pair of just thin nylon soccer shorts. I have these. These are kind of an extra, kind of a perk. It gives me something clean to sleep in. Um, sometimes my hiking shorts are wet, so I like to put these on to sleep in. Keeps my bag cleaner. Um, that helps. And then I have uh, polypro top and polypro pants. Lightweight, not anything, not the knit or heavyweight. Usually you don't need it. Uh, and then my hiking clothes is a pair of nylon shorts and a synthetic blend uh, button-up shirt, which is just nice, makes makes things easier. You can unbutton it or you can not wear it, which I do most often when I'm hiking. Um, as far as protection from the elements, I have a rain jacket, which is a coated nylon rain jacket that stuffs down into its own pocket. That just helps for, pa for packability, making it easier to fit in your pack. This is uh, a waterproof breathable, it's called. But I rarely, I try, especially in the warm weather, I very rarely use this. 
Um, if it's raining, I never put this on. I sweat too much in it. This is just good for cold weather, um, chilly nights sometimes. And then my main insulation layer is also packs into its own pocket. And it's a... Uh, just has a synthetic fill similar to the fill that's in a sleeping bag. It's a pullover, has a three quarter lens zipper, and it's actually incredibly warm. If I got into a situation where I needed warmth and my sleeping bag wasn't warm enough, I'll sometimes sleep in this. Because if I'm going to carry the weight anyway, I might as well get the most use out of it. For footwear, I'm basically using like a trail runner. This is a this is a bit bulkier than a normal trail runner. I uh, started out with just plain old trail runners, just basically running shoes with a slightly uh, sturdier sole and have made it up to these. Um, it's nice because it's a lightweight pair of shoes. It takes practically no break in. I have a pair of insoles, supermarket brand, not um, ones that I bought in the outfit or anything, but they're, they have a plastic plate under the um, instep, I guess this would be called, and the heel. Kind of a little bit more support than the insoles that came with the sneakers. Um, so I think that makes a big difference. But it's great that I can use sneakers because, I, again, I don't have to worry about blisters. Um, and your feet are lighter. There's that old saying, which is almost, it's definitely a cliche, but... They say uh, for every pound on your a pound on your feet feet is like a pound, five pounds on your back something like that. People have said different numbers, but I kind of do agree with it. Definitely, if your feet are lighter, you move uh, better. I haven't had a problem with rolling my ankles because I'm more agile because my pack's lighter um, and my footwear is lighter. I if I step on something and feel my ankle start to roll, I can right myself or jump over to another rock or so I haven't had a problem and another thing I actually have a pair of sandals here that I carry and I actually hike in these as well occasionally it's nice because it kind of airs out my feet which after many miles they need and uh, it just feels good it's a dip it's a change the footbed feels different uh, then the footbed in my sneakers, it gives my feet room to spread out. One thing I notice after hiking in them for a while that my feet will get tired because the muscles are spreading out in a way that they don't in my shoes, in a way that they're not used to. If the weather is at all severe, um, for example, I stayed on top of Max Patch. It was rainy and windy. And uh, people that were up there all had tents set up. And they saw me getting ready to set up my tarp, and they were like, you're going to sleep in that up here? Like, this is the wrong place for that. So I just laughed, and set, I pitched the tarp real low. And since it's 8 by 10, it overhangs my head and my feet uh, with a few feet to spare. So the wind would have to be driving the rain at a ridiculous angle for it to come in. Um, you, you have to pitch it accordingly. You, knowing like kind of knowing the wind direction and but I haven't had any problem with it blowing in from either sides and this is what I use for light it's a LED light it has two ways to turn it on you push a button or there's a little switch so it stays on um, they run on watch batteries I actually haven't had to replace the battery in this my whole trip I've hooked a alligator clip onto the back using a small machine screw so I can clip it on to the brim of my baseball hat and use it like a headlamp um, which works great for reading sometimes I just clip it on my shirt and get it in the direction I want it works good for reading works good for hooking into my tarp if I have to cook in my tarp for some reason and need light so it just makes them a little bit more versatile and it's still about I wouldn't be surprised if it's one of the, if it's the lightest flashlight headlamp you could carry. For my stove, um, for my, I look for something lightweight and powerful. Um, and what I found was a small, commercially made stove here, uh, which you screw on to a um, fuel canister. 
like so. It's uh, 84 grams. The only bad part about it is um, these canisters are not refillable and they're not recyclable. And something needs to be done about that. If I did it all over again, I would probably at least try um, the alcohol homemade stove um, for a little while um, because they're definitely lighter. Than, they're the, the alcohol stoves are the lightest option that I've seen on the trail. And this is heavier, although I like the simmer control this has and it can boil water faster than anything I've seen on the trail. Um, but with my pack weight at the at the point is at the point it is right now, I forget I'm wearing a pack. So when I question my gear, which I do every once in a while, I almost always come to the conclusion that I don't even feel it anyway. So I don't really feel a need to change um, when when I feel completely free and comfortable with what I have. When I leave town after resupply, it may get up to around 20 pounds or maybe a little over, depending on how many days that is. But on the Appalachian Trail, you usually don't need more than three days of food at a time. For my frame, which it doesn't have a frame, so for some stability, I have a closed cell foam pad, which is pretty thin. Um, and I roll it up inside in a, in a circle, like so, and then stuff my gear in the middle of that. And that gives me, throughout the day, it gives me a great support because it actually contours to my back. I have my sleeping bag and my clothes inside, a lot of soft stuff. And I arrange my soft stuff against my back and put my cook set on the outside of my pack. So throughout the day, it, it, it uh, you know, molds to my back. It's, a, it's very comfortable. I prefer it to a regular frame pack. Um, I know some packs have the frame supports that actually push the pack off your back a tad, so there's a little air circulation. Um, so a disadvantage with this is when I have both the straps on, I always have, I, I don't have any circulation going between my pack and the back. Um, so it gets quite sweaty and sometimes a little slippery and really hot, really hot days and big climbs. Um, but luckily with the low weight, um, I can carry it on one shoulder and just have it on one shoulder and then this side of my back is completely aired. Another thing about this pack is um, it doesn't have a hip belt. Um, a lot of people like hip belts, they like the, the stability that it provides um, so that in their range of motion their pack is always in the same place on their back. Um, for me, I don't need that um, with my low pack weight. Um, I find that the straps are sufficient to keep it tight on my back. Um, and I, I also, a lot of times when I wear it, I, I put my thumbs If, I, if I'm in a rough section, I'm moving around a lot, I have one hiking stick and I may put my thumb in just to tighten it down a little bit. And you can, you can also tighten up the straps pretty easily to get a snug fit. Um, but uh, if, if you have a pack with no hip belt and you don't carry less than 20 pounds, then you're probably going to start having shoulder fatigue and that's something where if you commit to a pack with no hip belt, you have to live by it. And if not, you're going to get tired. Um, we started out with a, like a 13 ounce pack and the, the weight was really nice with that. Um, we, we had a, a sleep system that, that was uh, a quilt that we both slept under. Um, we had some pretty lightweight, thin pads that we slept on. Um, we were pretty comfortable. Um, they, they, it, it worked all right, um, but there was a, a few nights of some really cold weather that we found 
it had gotten down to 15 degrees and we found that we were really cold with with the light the lightweight system yeah the lightweight system of what we were carrying and we realized that it would be good in in colder weather to have actual sleeping bags or a little more a little more insulation thicker and pad yeah we we went to a bigger pack that's now like three and a half pounds which is is very comfortable also on our our shoulders because you can get some of the weight off your shoulders with the hip belt. We found that was very nice with the addition of three pounds and and also we have changed to Thermarest because we found we weren't sleeping good from day one with the the, the lighter pad and now with the thicker foam pad, thicker um, air mattress, we found that we've been sleeping a lot better and it's worth the, the half pound extra of weight. So our, our shoulders aren't as sore um, coming out of town. You know, it's more comfortable with, with full suspension pack, but then your, your legs feel the weight and your feet feel the weight, mm. which we've realized there's a, certain, there's a certain weight where we're comfortable hiking. Right. And when we go over that, then it's, it's not fun, and that can be a matter of a couple pounds, which we end up going over every now and again, and it's, it's not near as fun. Um, I started the trail with a... Uh, 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 ultralight pack uh, with no hip belt. I weighed in at around 28 pounds. Uh, that was f with uh, five days of food. I found that uh, after four or five hundred miles I had a shoulder ache which I related to arthritis. Uh, but without a hip belt that started bothering me. So in Damascus I switched over to a pack with a hip belt and that relieved the problem. Didn't completely solve it because I have arthritis in my left shoulder. I maybe tried to carry too much weight in it. Um, maybe I didn't go light enough on my clothing or my accessories. Been hiking since March, and I uh, started out with a external frame pack, uh, a one-man tent, and the works. It weighed about 45 pounds. As I got into New England, the weight began to wear on me, uh, and I knew I had the toughest section of the trail to come. I decided I had to reduced my weight significantly. I got rid of my tent, uh, went to a tarp, a sleeping tarp. I went from four pounds down to approximately 10 ounces, maybe 15 mistakes. Um, another thing I did is I dumped my water filter. I've gone to Clorox. Uh, so far it's worked very well, much, much lighter. And uh, of course the, uh, the, the pack itself. As you can see, it is a uh, pack with the mesh outside. Um, Lightweight, I went from about a, uh, a, a four, four or five pound pack, I forget which, down to a pack of 29 ounces. Uh, it's lightweight, it has it's, uh, no frame at all in it. You use your, your uh, uh, sleeping pad for the, for the uh, backing for the padding and it works as a frame in the back. Uh, one thing that this pad, this bag has that I like very much is it has a padded hip belt it works very well, so I'm kind of at the limit of this pack, about 30 pounds with three days of food and water. And um, so the, the hip pad does well to take the, uh, uh, some of the weight off my shoulders. Don't expect the hiking to be always easy when people say it's easy. Um, and don't push yourself to go any faster than you really want to. Hike comfortably for yourself and not for somebody else. Um, because it's you that is ultimately the one that will enjoy the experience. Um, so you have to pace yourself to, to what is best for you or you have to listen to yourself and say, if I don't want to go 110 miles today, don't go 10 miles today. Um, and don't worry about being totally on schedule. Um, you know, if you have time constraints, you have to worry about that. But, you know, take the time to take care of yourself. I mean, the experience of being out here is just as important as, as making it to the end. I would agree with what Lightning Rod said. It seems that most people, myself included, get so caught up in knocking out the miles and you do have to be cognizant of your daily mileage in order to 
make sure that you can reach Katahdin and climb Katahdin, which they close in the middle of October. However, to be obsessed with doing daily mileage in lieu of um, experiencing some, uh, some of the highlights along the trails are just taking a day off or just relaxing at a view or a waterfall or what have you, I think it's a mistake to forego that. I think it is important to be able to have the flexibility to, to you know, accommodate yourself and to be able to take the time off and to be able to experience the highlights along the trail. And to preclude yourself of that is, 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 is diluting the potential experience. Well, they have a slogan on the trail, hike your own hike, which is don't get caught up with having to stick with a group of people even though you get along with them real well and, and uh, they become your friends because sooner or later you're probably gonna run into them again. You know, they'll be stuck in a town for a week or they'll jump off the trail and they'll get back on and you'll be really surprised because you'll see them. And don't get depressed thinking that you're not going to make it in time because Katahdin's not going to go any place. And I got real depressed for a while because I thought, oh my God, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to, they're going to close the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to close the mountain? <laughs> so I just kept hiking, and then I, I finally realized that you know, I could do however many miles I want to and uh, still make it. And make sure to give yourself enough time, give yourself at least six months to do it. Because if, you, if you're pressed for time, if you have to do it in four and a half months, five months, you're not going to have fun. And it's not going to be worth it. I've seen people hiking with swollen legs and... You know, they're just preoccupied with how much their pack weighs and how fast they're going and if they're going to make it on time and why. You know, <laughs> relax. You're not, this isn't a job. You're out here to get away from that. That's what I'm out here doing. Don't be afraid to quit your job. <laughs> and, uh, and don't be afraid to do it. And just don't be afraid. Just start hiking. It's... Uh, once you get out here, it's the best decision you'll ever make in your life. I mean, it's great. I love it. I, I sing songs, which unfortunately, I don't know very many songs all the way through. <laughs> I know like a few lines or maybe a verse, and I sing them, and then I hum a little, and then I go on to another song. So I think what I would have done before I started the trail was to get a songbook and learn some songs all the way through. Sometimes the time just seems to drag on. Uh, I got to Wolf Rocks, which was about six miles from my starting point today, and I just felt like I had already put in an entire day's work. Um, and I do mean work on coming over these rocks. Of course, I had only been out for about three hours, and it seemed like about 10 hours. And I realized I had another 12 miles to go, and I was about ready to come apart at the seams. Um, three miles later, I got to the sh uh, Kirkridge shelter, and there was a day hiker there who had come in from the opposite direction. And he gave me the very good news that the trail, the rest of the trail into <coughs> the Delaware Water Gap was a lot easier. There were some nice uh, grassy dirt roads. The rocks tapered off quite a bit. And he was right, and it really brightened up the day. Um, if I would have had to walk another six miles over those rocks from the shelter into Delaware Water Gap, I think I would have just been ready for a rubber room when I got here. The biggest thing that I found over time is that weight is your enemy. And it, it really comes, for, you know, it, it, you do need, especially at the beginning of the hike, to take some time and be really critical about what it is you're carrying it and why you're carrying it. And uh, you know, just don't be afraid. If you're afraid that you have something you want, you might not want, or you're, you're afraid that if you send it home, you'll want it again, it's easy enough to send it ahead to a post office five or six days down the trail and then make the decision whether you really need it or not. It's a big difference between what you need and what you want. And I think the closer that what you want becomes what you need, the less weight you're carrying and, and really like the weight is your enemy. Weight is what holds you back all the time. The other day I had an experience where I was about to walk by um, 
Upper Goose Cabin. And this is a, a unique place on the Appalachian Trail. It has canoes, uh, offers wonderful swimming, and is just kind of known as a place. They, they serve you pancakes in the morning. I was about to walk by it because I hadn't done enough miles that day. And I paused at the trail and I thought for a second, well, why, why am I out here? What am I doing? Well, the point of this experience for me is to, is to see and explore and it's easy to get caught in the, in the rat race of trying to get in your miles daily. But I know one thing, when I hit the end of this journey, I'm never gonna look back and say, I wished I'd hiked more miles on a given day. Instead of walking down the trail and going to a shelter that looks a lot like most of the other shelters I've been to, I rode in a canoe. I went skinny dipping and I ate blueberry pancakes. And I know in 10 or 20 years, when I look back at this experience, that's why I'm here. And it's so easy to lose focus on that. This is an experience to, to interact with the world, not just get to a certain destination every day. And if you think you can't get caught in a rat race out here, you're absolutely wrong. Uh, it's about experiences, and that was a wonderful one. I hiked a total of five miles that day, and it was one of the better days I had on the trail. I think I'm one of the very few people um, on this trail who do not have an agenda or a schedule. I simply wanted and needed the room uh, to hike, to be by myself, uh, to um, be completely free and uh, to learn what that is like. And so for me, um, completing this trip was to have that experience, basically. Um, I didn't know from the very beginning whether I would just be out here for a month or five months or six months. And it just happened to be so that I will be climbing Katahdin. But um, that was not necessary for me to have a successful trip. And uh, sometimes I do get Im impatient like everybody else when there's, it's a really hot day, a really stiff climb or a really nasty rainy day, stormy day, thunderstorm and I just want to get done with the day, I want to get to camp. And I stop for a moment and I remind myself that my foot will never touch this particular piece of dirt again ever in my life. And even if I step back that very instant, it's not the same anymore. That part of my life is gone. And to just really be aware all the time how quickly that goes by and, and how, how special it is to be able to be out here and experience this trail or any other trail for that matter. It's not uncommon to find 25 or 30 people congregated around a single shelter. Um, if one is, is, if it's important to find solitude, uh, camping by yourself in uh, many secluded areas is absolutely possible. But personally, I have found my interaction with others to be very valuable and, and a big experience of the trail. Uh, while you're actually hiking during the day, um, given the distances that we're covering, you will have and experience a tremendous amount of solitude. There is ample opportunity, more than you can possibly imagine, to kind of contemplate uh, you know, various issues or transitions you're going through. And it's very pleasant at the end of the night to actually congregate in a place where you find kind of the essence of the experience, which a lot of it is community. Um, there are people that wish, um, you know, that they could just get away from everyone. Well, that's not something you're generally going to find during the main hiking season. But if that were a goal for someone, you could really avoid most of the people by simply camping away from the shelters. Uh, be prepared for the worst right up front because it can happen right up front. I uh, hurt my right knee, I slipped in the mud, I hurt it and it took me 600 miles of lots of medication and a new set of poles before I could uh, make it up the trail. I lost about a week off right off the start. Uh, I took my time, I stayed off the trail two days, uh, got on and did two four mile days, got off a day, got on and did six mile days got off another day, got on and did two 12-mile days and said, I can do it. Um, so don't, uh, a minor, I consider it a minor injury, 
but you don't have to pack up your goods and go home. You've got to just take it easy. Uh, it's very hard right at first, the second day in, to uh, say, oh man, I hurt my knee. And I, I had actually bought an airline ticket, but I decided not to use it. <laughs> and, I, I, and I truly believe that some people go on the trail and hurt themselves and jump off the first chance they get, no matter how bad the hurt is. I've seen a lot of people that have uh, uh, high-priced clothing, high-priced equipment, uh, real fancy tents, and it doesn't make them hike any better and doesn't help them to enjoy the trail anymore. So you can have a good hike on a low budget. It's just, it's just a matter of uh, whatever your preferences are. Get some idea for your planning purposes as to what type of hike you want to have, whether you want to have a, uh, a, a six-month hike where you stop and see some things along the way or a five-month hike in which you see less or maybe even a seven or seven-and-a-half-month hike uh, in which you want to stop and see everything. There'll be some combination that'll work for you. Try to pick out some of the things that are of interest to you. If you like wildflowers, study up on them and make it a goal to learn as many wildflowers and to try to see and spot as many as you can. Uh, but be prepared to change once you get underway because very few people finish this hike in the same manner that they started. Uh, one thing I can say about the trail is most of your support uh, it's not from home, it's not from family, it's not from your friends, it's from the hikers on the trail. And you most of the time can rely only on the other hikers. These are the people who will support you mostly when you are down. And uh, this kind of sub subculture was created on the trail that, you know, true hikers are from different origin, uh, they are from different profession, different age. But I had a big problem once um, before in Tennessee. I remember it was in Tennessee. And I mean, like in a minute, I, I got plenty of hikers who came by me and offered me their help. Uh, you always can rely on, on other hikers. So uh, that's something good about the trail is you know you're not alone out there. Another thing is uh, not being serious about everything, which is uh, real common on the trail. You hike with people, you know, very few people, you know, are serious about much about, you know, of anything. You know, there's, whenever you hike with someone, you're always joking around, you're always laughing about everything, and that's pretty important because, you know, that's what a lot of people are on the trail to get away from, is everyone being so serious, you know, in, in the, quote, real world. And, uh, you know, you, if you take, take things too seriously, then that's when, that's when something goes wrong, it's really gonna, it's really gonna take you down, so you need to kind of take things a little bit lightly, you know, because things aren't always gonna be peachy keen, you know, you gotta be able to deal with the little hassles and the little problems that pop up. This has got to be the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Um, it is so great, uh, but at times, you, you know, you're gonna have your down times, and what you gotta realize when you're de depressed or down or having a rough day, or your feet hurt, you got to realize that it's going to get better. It may be a few minutes, it may be a couple of days, but as long as you realize that you're, it's going to get better, then you're in good shape. Keeping clean, I would say hygiene is uh, a, good, a good way to keep your spirits up if you can try and keep clean. Um, you'll only be able to take a full shower every so often when you stay at a hostel. But most of the shelters have water sources nearby. You can do what I do, which is to simply dip my bandana in the water and just kind of rub down. Now, a lot of people seem to focus in on equipment and food and clothing uh, when they're planning their hikes. But uh, that isn't what's going to get you from Georgia to Maine. Um, as we know, about uh, only one out of every eight people who start the trail finish. And they don't drop out because of equipment or uh, clothing or food. They drop out because they, they shortchange uh, a very important aspect of what's going to get you from George to Maine, and that's your, what's in your heart, uh, what's in your mind, you know, the emotional, psychological aspects of long-distance hiking. Most people who hike the trail find that it's much more difficult than they expected it to be. So uh, what I try to specialize in and emphasize when I prepare people through the Appalachian Trail Institute, and, and it seems to work, is uh, philosophical, psychological aspects of this long distance uh, journey. First of all, it's not a hike. Uh, it's not recreation. It's a journey. It has much deeper meaning. 
Uh, secondly, I think you really have to form a very uh, healthy relationship with the trail. The trail isn't out there for you. Uh, I think the trail, you're out there for the trail, and the trail is going to mold and shape you in any way it deems fit. And if we resist this, if we resist this and say that we have to control the trail, we have to control the weather, we have to control the ascents, we have to control the descents, and if we maintain this combative, uh, uh, competitive uh, philosophy towards the trail, uh, people aren't going to enjoy it. And I think that's the thing that people find hard, to, to give up that control, to, to rediscover uh, that feeling of, uh, of flowing rather than fighting. And s some people never find it. Uh, s some people aren't willing to say, uh, that I have to change. Some people don't want to change, but you are going to have to change. You're going to be probably more lonely than you've ever been. Uh, you're going to be more uncomfortable than you've ever been in your life. You're going to have to uh, expand your uh, levels of comfort. You're going to have to learn to get by with very little. Uh, you're going to have to redefine your uh, wants. And uh, you, you have to hike according to your needs, what you really need. Not what you want, but what you actually need. One thing, uh, the mistake that people make is that they carry too much weight and they hike too fast. And we carry that, you know, we become conditioned that way. In, in a house, we have five or six rooms that we can spread out all our things we need for our comfort. But when we're backpacking, we have to have all those things on our back. And every step of the way is that weight's coming down on your knees. And so people take too much. Uh, they want too much comfort on the trail. And uh, backpacking is one thing. In our avoidance of discomfort, uh, we will become more uncomfortable. Uh, I'll say that maybe once more slowly. In our avoidance of discomfort, we may become more uncomfortable. In other words, the more comfort we want, the more things we're going to have on our back, and the more uncomfortable we're going to be. Uh, and pace, you know, we, we're always in a hurry to get someplace. You know, we, we, we have to redefine. You know, it isn't like driving a car. It isn't like riding a bike. You have to adjust to the notion that you're only going to be able to do one or two, or possibly when the trail gets easy, two and a half miles an hour. And 20 miles on your bicycle might only take you uh, a half hour, 45 minutes or an hour, and in your car it might take you a, a half hour. But when you're walking, 20 miles is going to be a very long day, and you're going to have to adjust to that. You're going to have to learn new levels of patience. Uh, you can't be in a hurry to get there. Uh, you have to take it one day at a time. Uh, you have to be disciplined. Uh, you have to learn to live with yourself and in real life there's lots of distractions you know we we can watch tv we we have our jobs we have maybe some of us have our families we can do chores around the house and there's a variety of things that we can do to take that focus off of us so we don't have to think about our fears and our hopes and our dreams we don't have to think about our ourselves but on the trail you're stripped down all you're doing is walking and eating and sleeping and it becomes very simple and and you don't escape yourself and, and some people drop out of the off the trail because I don't think they can live with themselves uh, alone under those conditions uh, you're uh, another thing you have to be willing to give up is your emotional fat your defense mechanisms uh, many people relearn how to cry uh, many male backpackers uh, that I've talked to actually cry on the trail for the first time in, 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 in their lives. And you just have to, and on the other side, on the positive side, you're going to have to learn how to find enjoyment even in the smallest thing. Uh, swimming in a waterfall, sliding in a waterfall, feeling the breeze come across your face, uh, eating the same thing day in and day, uh, day in and day out. Uh, you have to take enjoyment in the simple things you know and, and if you can't learn how to play on the trail then you know you're going to be miserable if you can't learn to uh, laugh in the face of adversity and always say well it could always be worse let's say if you go through your eighth straight day of rain 
but at least you can say that the springs aren't going to be dry anymore. Or if you go through your two straight weeks of drought, dryness, at least you can say you don't have to put wet socks on in the morning. And you're always going to have to look at the brighter side. And if you're a type of person that's rigid and doesn't want to give out, up that control, uh, that always wants to have things the way they want them, you're not going to be able to do the trail. And that's why I feel the most important thing is, is that you, although the trail is not a living, thinking thing, it's still, you're out there for the trail. And the trail is going to, if, if, if you try to conquer the trail, you're not going to make it to Maine. If you learn to flow with it and take what it has to offer and accept what it has to offer, then chances are you're going to finish. And no matter how expensive equipment you can have and how much time you spend looking at equipment or food, when it comes down to it, the difference between those who finish and those who don't are in, in people's hearts and minds. I don't know, my first hike, having food mailed to me and buying my food ahead of time was a big uh, security blanket because I knew what was coming and you know I knew I would be able to eat it and it would be okay. Uh, but my experience is that along the trail there are more than enough places to easily resupply. Uh, I don't have to. I don't have extra food being given because I decided I don't like something or I sent more food than I needed for a segment. So and I'm not paying to ship it. So in the long term, even though it might be more expensive occasionally to to shop at a convenience store. It's probably really more economical to buy food as you go. You buy what you need, what you want. If you decide you want a treat, it's easy to throw it in. Something you're sick of eating, it's not still coming. Generally, I'll try to plan on about five days between resupplies. Uh, some stretches, it might run seven. Some stretches might mean I buy food somewhere every day. I personally have gone for the mail drop for, for basically the following two reasons. One, I'm kind of picky about the quality of the food, and one never knows in the small towns that you may encounter exactly what you're going to get in the local markets. So it's a little bit more of a crapshoot of, you know, they'll have the brand that you like. I personally prefer shopping in health food stores and like certain products that I know there's a good chance I won't be able to get in the local markets. The other thing is, uh, when you're walking on the Appalachian Trail week after week, most things are dictated for you. The weather, the quality of the shelter, the other hikers, you have to be flexible and take things as they come. But when it comes to my food, I actually like the certainty of knowing what I'm going to get. Initially, didn't send myself any mal drops. I didn't use any mal drops. I was buying everything in the supermarket. Um, just talking to people, I, I've heard that sometimes you get sick of what's in your mal drops. Sometimes they're not there. So I figured that that would be the best way. And then in going to the stores, I found that a lot of the portions you buy in stores aren't appropriate for carrying only three days. For example, a jar of peanut butter, maybe a pound of peanut butter, but you only need six or seven tablespoons of it. So I started a bounce box, which is a box that I would put the extra stuff into and send to myself three days ahead and get it and drain it maybe there and start one again at another town. Um, I like doing that and then for this last section I did send myself two mal drops so I've kind of experimented with all of them. Uh, I think I would, if I was doing it again, I would have mal drops occasionally with bulk foods that I could get cheaper and save a lot of money by buying them bulk. and. I would have those in my drops, the standards, you know, like the pasta and things that aren't going to change. And I would supplement that with stuff I bought each time at the grocery store. Uh, there's a lot of people who never carry more than three days worth of food because food is their heaviest thing. Um, towards the end of the trip, I've been stretching it a little bit further, carrying more food to go into town less just to save a lot of save some money because it seems the more you go into town the more money you're going to spend regardless of if you have a mal drop or not you're going to buy a soda here stuff like that and it all adds up so i've been trying to do it less and less but there's it's relatively easy to resupply 
along the trail. Most of the stores know through hikers are coming in, so they cater to stuff that we need. The disadvantages to the mail drop system, of course, is the U.S. mail does not work on Sundays. So one can perhaps get into town and be held up because of the mail drop. In the beginning, I used to carry food uh, <laughs> between nine to ten days just because I did not want to go into town. And I cursed um, regularly the first four days and ate more than I should have just to get the weight down, which then in turn just forced me to go back into town. So finally, I've learned uh, to try to resupply every three to four days. Um, and I've become a lot more disciplined with um, what I'm eating when I'm on the trail and had to really work on my um, uh, yeah, self-discipline um, to stay within uh, my food budget. And the easiest way I found was to put a day's allowance of food in one bag and, and really not touch the others. <laughs> Um, that way I, I uh, yeah, I make sure I'm, I'm going to be able to, um, to make it through the three, four days and uh, eat until the last, the last evening or morning. I do 100% of my resupply by buying along the trail. I buy, I, I've sent one drop box uh, because I had some things that I had left over when I originally bought my supplies. And that was 10 days out. And since then, I've bought every ounce of my food on the trail. Uh, you sometimes don't have good choices in the Mon Pa stores, but I haven't starved to death. I have lost 30 pounds, but probably 20 of it needed to be lost. Yeah, there's been uh, a few times along the trail where we've only been able to uh, resupply from a small uh, convenience store or a really small grocery store. And uh, we found that it's there's ways to do it that are really easy. Um, there almost always is stuffing, um, a few, a few maybe Lipton type noodle, dried noodle dinners. Uh, there's almost always peanut butter. You can even find dried milk if you need to. Cereals, all these things that you can you can put together to last you at least three or four days. Candy bars, always there's candy bars. <laughs> Um, even the power bars have been available lately. One of um, my most nightmarish um, scenarios in terms of food supply uh, must have been a couple of um, convenience store type gas stations uh, when there was really just um, trucker, trucker food like donuts and Little Debbie's and stuff like that. And what I found there was um, maybe for inflated price and stuff like that, but um, um, it, it still worked. Um, I found some uh, whole wheat crackers. I found some cheese. I found some uh, macaroni. I found some granola bars. Um, I found tea bags, so I didn't have to drink just sugary hot chocolate or coffee. Um, I found actually some fruit, in which case, you know, I, I was willing to carry a little bit of extra weight to um, add to my uh, diet. And I found some fig newtons. I always find raisins and nuts, um, which really gives you a lot of protein and energy and vitamins. And um, basically, you know, oh, and I, find, I always find oats you know, for breakfast, and not just the instant ones, but um, the whole ones that need a long cooking time. I eat them cold with milk. I always find powdered milk. I can put some raisins in there. Um, it's a great meal. So I, I think um, I would be able to do this whole trip uh, from start to finish without sending supplies, um, just by being um, um, flexible and innovative and, and just keeping my eyes open in those little stores.
Hi, my name is Lynn Weldon. I'm the producer of the video that you're watching, as well as eight other backpacking videos. I through hiked the Appalachian Trail as well as the Pacific Crest Trail. We live in a society that believes that bigger is better. 300 horsepower is better than 150. 20 gigahertz is superior to 5 gigahertz. 6,000 cubic inches is better than 3,500 cubic inches. Today, I want to shake my fist in the face of that mentality and to state that zero is a beautiful number, a number to be desired. As weight conscious backpackers, zero is our ultimate goal. In each of the seven categories, zero pounds should be what we strive for and sometimes it is attainable. Let's begin with the category of shelter. This one's an easy one because on the Appalachian Trail there is some sort of a lean-to every eight miles on the average. Thus there is really no need to carry a tent or tarp. By leaving these at home we will have achieved the zero state. Next, clothing. Until we get back to the garden, we probably will not reach our zero pound goal here. However, we can achieve a significant weight reduction by choosing our departure time more wisely. Why leave Georgia in March or early April when the probability of encountering snow in the mountains is almost 100%? Instead, consider late April or May when the warmer temperatures have arrived. Or consider a north to south hike leaving Maine sometime in the middle of the summer when again summer is here, leave the cold weather clothes behind. The third category is the sleeping system. Now we can make aggressive moves towards the zero goal by doing one of two things. Either investing in a top quality, expensive, down sleeping bag, or making your own sleeping blanket that has a very precise custom fit that has eliminated excess width and length. While you're at it, consider leaving your ground cloth at home and only using your foam pad that has been cut to a quarter, half, or three quarter length. Footwear, the fourth category. Like shelter, this one is relatively easy to attain. I had the opportunity to interview two women known as the Barefoot Sisters, who at the time did not want to reveal their identities. Let me show you a short clip that illustrates their love for zero. Isis and I have been hiking, day hiking barefoot since we were really young kids. So we have sort of the awareness that it takes and the some of the muscles, I guess, that it takes. But before we started our southbound through hike, I was, I'd been in college. I graduated 10 days before we left. So I really didn't have much of a chance to get my feet in shape for it. So I pretty much hit the ground running. And it took probably, it was only a couple days before they were, before the soreness went away. 
but I'd say it was probably three weeks before the muscles were built up and the calluses were thick enough that I could really walk over just about anything. Right now we're hiking barefoot some of the time and in sandals some of the time. Sandals are a lot easier on gravel and we can make a lot more miles that way. If we weren't concerned about mileage, I would probably be going barefoot all the time. It's much more comfortable. Hiking barefoot is probably 90% mental because you're always calculating where you're going to put your next step and you always, you just, it's sort of a game of predictions. You figure out what's the best place to put your foot and how you can best how you can best attack the trail. I feel a lot closer to the trail and to the woods, to the earth around me. The granite rocks in Maine were just like walking over the back of an ancient whale or something with all the barnacles and so gnarled and it just felt like I could I could feel the glaciers scraping over those rocks and imagine their geological history. And then there were places in Connecticut we walked through a lot of fields and fertile farm fields and I remember how that mud felt and it just felt so full of life and so vibrant. And in Pennsylvania the rocks just felt well, <laughs> some of them felt pretty malevolent when they tipped the wrong way or just but they felt alive. And and hiking in shoes kind of deadens that sense of the trail and sense of the earth. The most we've ever hiked barefoot was a twenty three and the last four of that was after dark under a full moon. The most numbers we've number of miles we've hiked in a day in sandals was forty one. The vulnerable parts of the feet are underneath the toes and the arches can get scraped. Also the tops of the toes are very vulnerable, especially when you get really tired. You can not pick your foot up quite high enough going over a root or rock and scrape the tops of your toes pretty easily. But I find that it's worth that risk because the kinds of scrapes that I would get on my toes would hurt for maybe five minutes and heal in two days, whereas the blister that I got when I put shoes on took a couple weeks to heal and it hurt for the whole time that it was being worn on. And when I lost two toenails, that took months to heal and hurt for quite a while also. We were really worried about twisting our ankles at the beginning of the hike and we were also worried about arch support because so many people say that they have problems with their arches falling out and we both have very high arches but it turned out after about two weeks of hiking we realized that we had strengthened the muscles in our ankles and arches so much that we really didn't have anything to worry about there and I think that part of the problem with people hurting their ankles or losing their arches may be that it's too supported and so the muscles that would naturally be supporting those parts of the foot never have a chance to strengthen and do their job they've atrophied because the foot is tied down to a shoe or strapped down with a high boot. I would say the first thing to do is to get used to it and just get yourself accustomed to going barefoot and start just walking around your house and your lawn barefoot but avoid gravel because that's the hardest thing to that's the hardest thing to walk on. Um, Soft woodland trails are nice. Sand is really nice to start off on and then work up to rock surfaces and gravel eventually. I would also recommend to anyone who's going to consider hiking barefoot to carry a pair of light shoes. At least carry some in your pack. I did cut my foot once and I would have it would have taken me a lot longer and I would have been still trying to walk out of there after dark if I had not been carrying some sandals. The most important thing to do if you're doing long distance hiking barefoot is to keep your feet moisturized. And to do that we have a salve that we make out of equal parts of olive oil and beeswax. What we usually do is just apply it every night before we go to bed and then put socks on our feet. And that keeps our calluses from cracking. When you first take your shoes off or when you first set down your feet in the morning there's a peculiar tingle. I'm not sure I can describe it, but I've never felt it in anything else besides putting my feet down on the ground, and it's really a marvelous feeling. What I'm talking about is a feeling of being hyper-alive, 
like all the sensors in in the skin are all of a sudden turned on and a sort of a tingle or vibration between the ground and the foot I'm not sure it might be half imagination but I think the feet are more sensitive than people give them credit for I think a lot of society pens them up and <laughs> puts them out of the way and they're considered smelly and <laughs> unattractive parts of the body but they're really very sensitive and it's kind of fun to let them free. The fifth category is the load transport system, commonly known as the pack. Radical improvements in pack design have dropped their weights significantly below two pounds. I have a company called LW Gear, and here's an example of a 14 ounce pack made almost entirely of mesh. There is a four ounce detachable hip belt that works with that pack. I also have a 23 ounce pack with side pockets and compression straps and also a tunnel here that allows you to insert a padded six ounce hip belt. There's also a company called GVP Gear that makes a very interesting pack. This is called the G4. And one of its innovative designs is that it has hollowed out shoulder straps and hollowed out hip belt in which you can insert extra clothing such as socks to achieve the desired padded effect. The sixth category is what I call miscellaneous gear. This covers everything from ace bandages to water purification systems. And there are very few items that are absolutely indispensable. For example, you can get by without a flashlight. A knife is not absolutely necessary. A mechanical water filter can easily be replaced by some sort of a chemical system. I could go on and on, but I think you get the point. And the good news is zero is definitely within reach. The seventh category and the final frontier is that of food. I think we Americans take food way too seriously. I read a book called the Long Walk, which describes the escape to freedom by six prisoners of war from a Siberian prison camp in World War II. They traveled over 4,000 miles from Siberia down to India. And when they left their prison camp in the heart of winter, each man had a flat baked loaf, a little flour, about five pounds of pearl barley, some salt, and some dried ration bread that they had managed to save in the preceding months. He goes on to describe how maybe once a week they would manage to catch an animal of some sort someplace and slaughter and eat that. But that was all the food they had for 4,000 miles. I also read a book called Eating Well for Optimal Health by Dr. Andrew Weil, a noted physician and nutritionist. And he has a chapter in here entitled The Possibility of Surviving Without Eating. Ask yourself these questions. Why do you eat three times a day? Is it out of sheer habit? Could you consider eating twice or even once a day. Why do you think so many Americans are overweight? One reason is as they get older their metabolism slows down but they haven't asked themselves these hard questions. Consequently they haven't changed their eating habits. This may seem like a foolish discussion but in reality 
its uncharted territory. You may already know that many calories are required to move a heavy pack down the trail. What is not so obvious is how few calories are required to move a light pack. Given the fact that resupply towns are so plentiful along the trail, I wonder if it's possible to carry little or no food, thereby reaching the zero pound goal. Here's a short clip that describes my own experimentation with food. I'm about to start my three day 60 mile hike on the Loyal Sock Trail. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. I had my normal breakfast at home a few hours ago, consisting of oatmeal, raisins, banana, and some apple juice with some vitamins. Uh, my pack weighs about um, uh, 15 pounds, I believe, and a lot of that is the video gear. When I was discussing my plans with my brother a few weeks ago, uh, he mentioned that some people he knows that have fasted for that period of time, three, four days, have become uncoordinated. So I made a mental note of that, and then on my way out of the house, I thought I should inform somebody as to my plans. And so I stopped off at a friend's house who happens to be a nurse, and uh, she became very concerned about uh, hypoglycemia. So uh, for better or for worse, I decided to stop off at a grocery store and get uh, three packets of Kool-Aid that are uh, filled with sugar and fructose. So just in case I do feel dizzy or faint or whatever, uh, I have something to turn to. I'm doing fine. I've been hiking for nine hours, taking breaks every one to two hours. I've done about 23 miles. It's been in the 80s today. Tomorrow they're calling for temperatures in the 90s for the first time this summer. Uh, I've been trying to drink fluids. Uh, I've probably consumed maybe two quarts today. Uh, but the, the good news is, I, I, you know, my stomach hasn't been gnawing away at me. I haven't uh, felt weak or dizzy. Uh, I really haven't felt hungry. I did uh, 23 miles today over very muddy and oftentimes overgrown trail. Temperatures were in the mid to upper 80s, very humid. And uh, I noticed when I started out this morning that uh, as I was climbing up hills, I felt very uh, listless and tired. So I thought either I'm not drinking enough water or I'm running low on calories. So I broke out the uh, Kool-Aid packets. I consumed two over the course of the day. Uh, mixed it in with my water. It made it much easier to uh, drink a lot. Uh, as a result, I drank about a gallon of water today, twice as much as I did yesterday. And uh, so other than my feet feeling somewhat beat up right now, I'm doing fine. I'm done. I'm celebrating by drinking my last cup of Kool-Aid. Compared to other times that I've hiked this trail with food, the only difference that I noticed was that on steep climbs, I had to stop more often to get my breath and to just uh, recover. Otherwise, hardly any difference at all. So, hope you're encouraged. And I'm heading back home. I got to hitchhike back to my car and figure out a sensible way to break my fast. See you later. In case you think that this discussion is getting too idealistic and too theoretical, let me introduce you to the first woman to ever through hike the Appalachian Trail, Mildred Norman Ryder, better known as Peace Pilgrim. 
She walked across the United States seven times in the cause of peace. Her vow was, quote, to remain a wanderer until mankind has learned the way of peace, walking until given shelter and fasting until given food, unquote. She carried nothing other than the clothes on her back, the shoes on her feet, some pen and paper, a comb, and a toothbrush in her pocket. In other words, she achieved zero pounds in four of the seven categories. What was her secret? She said that she died to herself. I want to encourage you to reach out and embrace this mysterious and wonderful number zero. Rather than fear having nothing, try to see how it actually leads to true freedom. Freedom to wander. Freedom to play rather than work. Freedom to be yourself and to reach out and touch other people's lives and thereby change the world around you. But it only happens when you have died to yourself. Then you will be ready to take a long walk. Thank you.